to be here. He worked hard. No, you're Westwood a good guy, dude. Studio. Don't be offended, man. I'm, I'm not offended. Thank, I love you, Bobby. You're I, always nice to me. I want to thank Kevin for putting the studio together. and uh, From After Buzz. Go After check them Buzz, out. He did a great fucking job. He really did. He came in here and busted his balls with Papa. This is a nice place right here, man. It's very nice. Yeah. It's walking distance. It's new. There's new spirits in here. We got the turntable. We got fucking everything. What's up with you, brother? I'm good, dude. I just got back from Cleveland, bro. How was the Cleveland? It was good. The audience is great, but dude, check it out. Dude. Hilarities. Yeah, dude. Great club. So this manager Saturday, no, yeah, Saturday comes up and goes, here's a note. And some dude called in during the day and said, here's my review on Bobby's set. <laughs> right? So he put, he's disgusting. I have it on my Twitter, actually. I'll read it to you. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, he, 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 first of all, you don't give that to the comic, do you? No. A review? You just let it go. I, I, I was, was going to kill myself. the owner or the manager? It was the manager. He, he was new, and then the, and the <coughs> fuck, dude, the manager, um, the owner, uh, Nick, yelled at him. You know Nick's a good dude. Nick's a good dude. He's a good, he's one of my favorites. He's you know like 75 man? years old. This guy's yeah. out there wrestling Puerto and he's Rico. he's strong, yeah. <laughs> he don't yeah, give yeah. a fuck. He don't give a fuck. Oh, here. Wanted to give feedback on Bobby Lee's show. Found him to be very obscene, crude, and tasteless. Very nice. Those are good words. Yeah, but you're a comic. <laughs> yeah, but dude, it's like, why would you call during, you know, out of, to put the time in to do that? And someone wrote it down at the club? Someone and then a club, it? and then if somebody wrote it down at the club, why would you write it down? <laughs> and then why would you give it to me? Like, here, here's, your day's gonna be fucked. L listen to this. You know what I mean? It's like, it hurts your feelings. You still get your feelings hurt? Dude, like, last week I was in um, Irvine Improv and... 12 women got up and just walked out five minutes of my set. Do you know why? Why? Because these are 12 women who met at a support group because their kids all have Down syndrome. And my first three minutes were about Down syndrome. And so they got up and left. Did they yell? No, but then they, they, they got their money back from the club. And then the manager tells you after the show. And it makes you feel like shit. It's like, I don't have anything against their kids. Every time I'm with Joey and someone walks out, you just laugh. I you just love laugh. it. I laugh. You do. Yeah. You got to push some of these buttons. You have to. You have to. Yeah. You have to, you know, to, 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 it's like Brad Pitt said, to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. <laughs> so sometimes yeah, yeah. you got to hurt somebody's fucking feelings. Yeah, man. but why would you come out, right? You just, you, you look at my photo, right? I'm naked in the photo. You know what I mean? And they go, Bobby Lee, this weekend. And then 12 older white women, you know what I mean, who have Downs ba babies, you know what I mean? They all come. And enjoy my. They they know something's gonna be said. Like if you don't have ninety sets on YouTube, like yeah. they didn't take the time to look at your YouTube. Yeah, like if I was to, if I came to your show and I go, wow, I'm a Christian. He swore a lot. Well, that's my bad. You know what I mean I didn't know he was Puerto Rican, whatever. You know what I mean, or Cuban, whatever you Same are. Shit. You know? Yeah, whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean. You've called me Chinese before. No, I haven't. <laughs> I always know you're Korean. Dude. Oh, you do. Yeah. Oh, I what a good guy, Korean. man. You're, you're a good, good guy. guy. You're a good dude. But, I, yeah. I, I've. Listen, you could, you're going to expect people to get upset, especially in today's society, especially in the society we live in. People are going to get upset, but what I don't understand is it's like a movie trailer. Before you go to the movie, you know there's some fucking in the movie or there's not. A, you know it's PG or R. Yeah. Same thing with the club. Same thing with YouTube. You can just go on YouTube and look at the comic. Oh, I recognize him from Mad TV or from some fucking movie or whatever, you know. Yeah. But my thing is, is that I have a door deal. I don't give a fuck if they left, but they get their money back, right? I'm Asian. I want my money. You want your money? Yeah. Even that was if, like that's like twenty two dollars or twenty five bucks. Even if they just saw three minutes, fuck them. Uh, you fuck want them. your money? I, yeah, fuck that, you! Yeah, I fuck want my you! Money. I want my fucking twenty five bucks. I'm from the other. Oh, oh. Listen, if they want to leave, leave. Yeah. If you want your money back? Take the fucking money back. You made a mistake. If you, but most of these people in today's society, they go home, write a review on Yelp, send you a fucking email, tell you how. I had a guy that sent me a thing from Vegas. He goes, that was the fucking dirtiest show I've ever seen. And he put, learn something from Cosby. Oh, is that what he That's said? That's what he wrote to me. And I'm like, Cosby raped fucking women, you dirty, dumb fuck. So, you know, yeah. that's the, you know, uh, it just, listen, you're not going to please everybody all the fucking time. Somebody's going to get upset. I feel bad when Death Squad guys come to my shows and bring their wives. And they're like, we love it. And the, you could see the girls are like, I don't even know why I fucking came here. <laughs> <laughs> this is crazy. He's talking about eating my ass and breaking into somebody's house and yeah. eating that pussy. So I know most women are sitting there going, what the fuck? But they love their men, you know, and they tolerate that shit because it makes them happy, you know? But the thing is, is that we don't think what we're saying is wrong. 
Like, you know, I do. I have a bit about, like, a Thai hooker eating my butthole, right? And then my girlfriend was like, yeah, my mom was in the audience, and I just don't think you should have told that joke. I go, what's wrong with it? Like, I don't know that it's wrong, but I guess... Well, is it wrong? It's it's not wrong. It's just that they don't... They're offended by it, or it makes them weird. No, you have to understand, when a Midwestern white person or whatever, right, they go to... School, they ha- they have church on Sundays, right? They go to work from nine to five. You know what I mean? They have kids. They don't know anything about that. So when I'm bent over on a stool and this Asian lady's eating my butthole, right? Like to me, that's every day. You know what I mean? I think about that every day. Every day. Yeah, that's my life. It's lifestyle. You know what I mean? But to them, it's like oh, shocking. You know what I mean? There's no man in what? America that doesn't want his butthole eaten. <sighs> Okay. You said it. I love it. I mean, there's no man that will say to you, you know what, I really don't enjoy when a woman licks my asshole. That guy, you just walk into the field. Do you like eating butthole? I like eating it. I like my asshole eating, but who am I going to talk to eat my ass? You know what I'm saying? (laughs) I got to talk like a fucking mule to eat my ass. (laughs) There's not a human that's going to eat my ass. Like a mule or a cat, though, like my ass. You don't seem like you have a dirty ass. It's probably just a big butthole. It's disgusting. Anybody's asshole is disgusting. Yeah, that's my whole point. That's why I'm not. It's delicious. Oh my god! Yours Everybody's seems like it's purple and like disgusting. bulbous. Is, your, is yours bulbous? Mine looks like a black person's foot. It's pink <laughs> and fucking. It looks like it stepped on a firecracker. Like yeah. a black dude stepped on a yeah. firecracker. Mine's the cute. Pink and mine's, mine's cute. It's like pink and very tight. My poop looks like angel hair pasta. <laughs> you know, it just comes out like in little tiny noodles. That's disgusting. And I know. That's disgusting. Yeah, thank you, man. No, but the, I, you know, think of if a guy walks out of a show. There's no man in America if a woman drops to her knees and says, I want to lick your ass. Oh, I don't believe in that. Yeah. Let I think me, there's a lot of guys who would say no to that. Let me lick it. Well, you, first of all, no woman's going to tell you she's going to lick your ass. She's just going to stick her tongue in there and you're going to hit the fucking, your, your eyeballs are going to hit the, the third eye. Is that really what happens? Like sure. the first time? Well, your girlfriend doesn't eat your butthole? No. no she well, don't look, look at me right now. No, Why not, not? not at all. Why not? Because I don't want her to. That's, yeah, that's on you. Oh, but, oh, well, I don't. That's on you. And you got to look in the mirror and you have to question yourself, man. Okay, listen. I'm a big, I'm a big dude. There's no way, like, even after a shower, like today, I took a shower and then immediately had to take a shit. So I'm. That's me too. It's never clean. <laughs> me too. But then, how do you have a girl lick it? The thing is, is that if they love you, they'll do it. You know, like I love my girlfriend. You know, I've done it. You know, and it's not. You know, there's like a, a, a taste. You know, a residue. Is it residue? Of shit. But no, but you don't know what shit... For, no. <laughs> yeah. But shit doesn't taste like shit. It smells like shit. When you eat shit, it doesn't taste like shit. Really? What does it taste like? It tastes like... like the food you ate. It yeah, tastes it, like the no, it doesn't. It's not you ate the night before. It's only brown now. <laughs> with the taste of intestines. <laughs> that same fuck... That same chicken corn and blue you eat at night tastes the same way shit. In fact, when you taste shit, you'll say to yourself, hmm... Fuck! It's a steak I ate at Ruth Chris. It's only brown and with the taste of it, intestine and grass. That yeah. Taste like. I've never eaten shit, but I smell my finger after you scratch your asshole. Yeah, so yeah. when you licked a girl's butthole, you never tasted shit. If I do, what do I care? What do you it's care? It's part of the game. That's part. It's of the, a game. It's Vietnam. I'm going deep. What yeah. do I care what it tastes Having like? Have a machete. Yeah. Once you go thick. down there, what do you care? Right. Exactly. I don't know. Blowjobs and sex are good enough for me, man. I don't. I don't know. But you gotta get freaky from time to time. That's freaky enough. Up your ass, something, yeah. a firecracker. A fin- I mean, oh, Jesus. Well, let me ask you this: Do you okay. do you go down on your girl? Absolutely. You do. Absolutely. And you don't travel south. Nope. <coughs> so you you the DMZ line, you just stop there. Do you I, look I, at I it? cross the DMZ line. Have you ever looked at her asshole? Of course, you look at it because it's there. But it's like it's, <laughs> I've. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are you What are you gonna do? Not look? It's there. Yeah, yeah. Like have during ever, doggy, during doggy, you look at it. But like, I'm not gonna stick anything. No. Have you ever seen your own asshole? I've never yes. seen mine. When you go to the how to do the when you go the colonoscopy the colonoscopy, they send you pictures of the camera three inches from your asshole going in. It shows oh, your intestines. Oh, I never got that test. You got to do it. All right. You're not 50 yet. Oh, okay. Once you turn 50, they, they make do you that? do it. Sag makes you do so it. So this is the first time you ever saw it? That's, yeah, you know. You had a high-def video. I mean, one that I was all cooked <laughs> up, and I put like a little mirror back there to see what was going on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, Sag will make you get the camera up the ass, and also they'll send you an envelope, and you got to put a piece of shit in there and mail it in. You gotta be kidding me! I swear to God, a little bit fifty. Wait, wait, wait. They give you a little envelope with a little stick. Yeah, and you gotta shit and take the stick and put it in the envelope, seal it, and mail it to them. And what do they do with that? They test the insides every like three years just to make sure <laughs> you're fucking. 
<laughs> you don't swallow seriously and shit like that. Yeah. I ain't fifty yet, so maybe it'll be. I can't wait. Fifty. 50, yeah, yeah. 49, they call I you. can't wait. Kaiser called me when I was 49. SAG just gave me the envelope again to take a shit. In, it. in fact, it was up here. I left it here because it was in my bag. And You still I, have the envelope? It's around here somewhere. Mm. It was in the old office before I moved it. Mm. Jesus. You so, working on TV <laughs> films? What are you doing these days? Well, I'm doing that love thing, which is like Judd's thing, but I'm only on three episodes. And I did an independent movie that uh, Universal just bought. I'm excited about. But other than that, I'm just hitting the road hard. You know what I mean? I'd like to talk about, you know what I mean, the John Caparillo situation. If you, you know. Before we get on John Caparillo, I want to tell you something as your brother. You, yeah, wait, wait, have, I, you I, have gone from one step to another in stand-up. Like your stand-up now, it's the best it's no, ever been. you, dude. You were killing me about two weeks You're ago. You're a fucking there. beast, bro. I've been watching you, and I'm like, this guy oh, changed dude. completely. That fucking one bit about the the Irish movie yeah, that yeah, you yeah. do. The I love that. Yeah, yeah. The fucking jungle gook with mm. the Filipinos. Mm. I still laugh at that. He, I called my Filipino friends and told them, and they're like, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You bring that up every few months. Like I when they guess, it. you're like, Bobby Lee calls Asian jungle. Oh, I, don't, I love it. Jungle Asians, not jungle gook, bro. Jungle Asians. Yeah, yeah, jungle yeah. Asians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Asians. Because my girlfriend's a jungle Asian. Oh, that's why you yeah, say that's why right, I say right. I think I can say that now. Yeah, but if once we break up, then I can't say it no more. You can't say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's funny, now you have the, what's the girl, Wong up at the store? Who's Wong? The dirty girl from Chelsea. She Ali just had Wong? a baby, Ali, Ali Wong. Wong. She's the best. And she was saying the other day, you know, I'm, I'm Chinese and something, and my husband's Japanese and something. And we sit at home and talk about Filipinos or whatever the fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, love yeah. her. I love her. That yeah. joke about that. She had to have a kid because a, mo- a pussy wasn't getting moist anymore. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my funny. God. I'm sitting in the back going, what the fuck? Yeah, Ali Wong's very funny, man. About it? You know what's great about the store now, though, is, is that since you and Joe have come back, no, everybody, it's just just li- no. Fuck, listen to what the fuck I'm saying. <laughs> Will you listen to what the fuck I'm, I'm saying, saying right I'm now? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna listening. give you a compliment, right? But you have to understand, it came. You came with the new changes, right? Because I've been there since the dark ages. I never left, right? So I've seen it, you know, grow. I've seen it destroyed, and it's better th- now than it's ever been. When was the first time you stepped foot? In I would. I went to the first time a Hollywood club about 1996. Wow. Yeah, and I was young. I was a kid. I was scared, and I did a belly room show, and I I got a couple of laughs, and I called my mom, like I'm gonna make it, you know. I remember Dante being there, you know Dante the comic for you. White Dante. Yeah, yeah. White comic. And he goes, "You did a good job." Fuck Dante, and I'm never gonna talk to that guy again. Okay. He fucked me. But I'm gonna talk about that later. Okay. But aside from that, um, yeah, so I was in 96, and then I moved up here in 98, and I got a doorman job, and it was rough, bro. For two years of just struggling. It was like, I remember one time I was sleeping out of my truck, because I was like a between places to live, and Jimmy Schubert, during the day, knocked on my window. I was sleeping in my truck, and he goes, hey, kid, uh, you hungry? I go, yeah, I'm going to buy a sandwich. Jimmy Schubert walked me down the street to um, Greenblatt's, and he bought me a sandwich, and I'll never fucking forget it. You know, it's that kind of fucking shit that I never forget, man. You know, Dice did that too a couple of times, and that's why I mean, people don't like Mencia, and I understand why. But he yeah. was very good to you. But for Carlos Jimmy, is very good to you. Yeah. He bought me a fucking car. Like I didn't do anything. He was I was his opener, and he goes, "Hey, dude, here's a car." You know what I mean? It wasn't new. It was his sister's, I mean, his girlfriend's sister's car. But still, it's like, sh- they didn't have to do that. You know what I mean? So it's like, I have had that relationship with Carlos. You know what I mean? But the whole time when I was opening for him, yes, you saw that he lifted bits. You know what I mean? But I would defend him because of the fact that he did so much for me. I was so poor. And the agent that I have now is because of Carlos. You know, I'm still with Matt, you know? And it's like, you know, I am loyal, you know? And when that shit went down, I was divided because I love Joe Rogan. Uh, Joe Rogan and I are very good friends. I love him. I have friends. I've been to his house. You know, you know, I love the guy. He's a great guy. But I was caught in the fucking middle of this fucking war. It was the worst two years when, of my life, seriously. Because when that video came out that Joe, you know, Joe exposed Carlos with the Bill Cosby thing, do you remember right, that? Yeah, you looked very uncomfortable. Yeah, when I was in that video. Yeah. So then, you know what he did? Carlos made me do a rebuttal video. So I was because I remember Mad TV was right next to Mind of Mencia, 
And it was during the last couple of years of Mad, and he caught me on set, right? He, him, his, his brother, his brother and Albert, they p sat me down. They go, "You're gonna do this rebuttal video that he doesn't steal." And then when that went out, oh my god, I had death threats for a year from comics. I'm gonna fucking kill you. You're never gonna work again. I mean, I would. It was crazy, dude. So it was a really fucking difficult time, dude. I'll tell you, I knew, I met Carlos. In the summer of 94, on the HBO Latino Loco Slam tour. Yeah. Yeah, I had fucking eight minutes of material. <laughs> and I got picked to open for him to do five minutes. I'll never forget that night because I had a, the kid who gave me a, dry, a ride brought his girl. He was from Brooklyn. Like, you know all the movies you see from Brooklyn? Mm -hmm. Like, he was from Brooklyn. And the girl he brought from Brooklyn was from Brooklyn. And he would tell her, shut the fuck up and sing. Just in the, in the middle of nothing? In the middle of nothing. We were driving. He would go, Coco, this is Janice. Say hello to Coco. <laughs> Janice, and then we course. get in the car and he's like, where are we going? Denver to this place. And on the way, she would say, I love the mountain. Shut the fuck up and sing. I told you to sing. And she would sing. Uh -huh. She would sing like a disco song. <laughs> there you were. And he would tell her, shut up, bitch. Keep talking. Wow. Then she would sing for two. Then she would say something again. He'd go, what did I just tell you? Sing a fucking song. She wants to be a singer, Coco. And she would sing in the car on the way there. It was fucking horrible. The girl was horrible. He kept telling her, don't worry, I'm going to make calls for you. I'm going to make you a star. Just keep fucking singing. What were wow. you doing as she was singing? Just sitting in the back? Dying in the back. <laughs> just dying. But I took Carlos' number, and I called him after that, and he was very good to me. And when I got to the store, Carlos was one of the ones that made a call for me to be a regular at the store. Mm -hmm. So I, too, was in the middle of that. You know, uh, I knew Carlos for the longest time. Yeah. You know? uh, well, I mean, it can't be. What are we doing? That was his number then. Oh, yeah. Six, six, yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. how long wow. I've known Carlos for. I still remember his number wow. in my head. I used to call him up and ask him for help. I knew Carlos, and I was in the same fucking position in the way. I felt bad. I felt bad. Remember we were in the Latino Laugh Festival, you and I, in San Antonio? We had no money. No money. You and I had no money. And his manager Sa took us out. Yes. Where is he? Worthy, Worthy Patterson. Patterson, yeah. He's still around. Is he I, around? I run, yeah, his kids are grown and stuff. I think he works for another big, bigger management firm. I don't know how well he's doing, but yeah, Worthy bought us meals because we couldn't eat. Couldn't eat. Do you believe that shit? It's, I mean, it's... Uh, just because someone steals jokes and because they're a bad, they do bad things professionally, doesn't mean they're a bad person. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it does, it, but in comedy though, you know, it's well, a, I mean, I can understand why people. I mean, that's always why it always sh shocks me when people who do stuff like that are also assholes. Like, yeah. if, you, if you're gonna if you're gonna do shitty things, be a nice per like at least try to be a nice person on other aspects of your life. Listen, it's funny because I was thinking about this today. Because all the Amy Schumer stuff. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. one, came, another allegation came out today, and I was sitting there thinking to myself, "Who allegated? Who was the allegation? Somebody. She stole another sketch for a show. Oh yeah. And I'm sitting there going, you know, I still remember when somebody came to me and said to me about Carlos, and they said a couple of things they wanted to do to him, and I said, "Listen, you're not going to accomplish nothing with smacking this kid." I'll never forget this. I said, "What you need to do is let him do what he's doing." And eventually he'll kill himself. You know, and I didn't mean it in a bad way. Mm. Because I'm a thief. I'm a real thief. I know what it is to put a gun to somebody. I know what it is to break in somebody's window. Mm. But I would never rob somebody's joke. I knew the price I paid when I was thieving. I know the prices I paid. I could name 20 of them the price I paid. So you always pay for your fucking sins. You know, when I first started in the business, the biggest joke thief on the world was Robin Williams. Mm -hmm. Everybody told you, even when I started in 91, that was the biggest thing people would tell you. He's a fucking joke thief. He paid people off. Like Stephen Pearl he stole Stephen from. Pearl yeah, Brian from. Bradley. Yeah. You know, so you have to think to yourself, didn't this guy kill himself? You know? Yeah. Uh, it's something that's really weird. I'm going to ask Bobby Lee a question. This is going to be the weirdest question. Bobby Lee of tonight, God forbid, and this is a big God forbid, you're on your way to heaven. What? And you made your decision. <laughs> and no, you made your decision. What? I'm just saying. He, like if, if I, if I, I kill myself? I die, no, no, no. If you, you never killed yourself. Let's pretend if I die. And I think of this whole comedy game on the way up. Yeah. And what I really got from comedy game, it wasn't the audiences, it wasn't the money, it wasn't the ability to make people laugh. To me is what you said, when somebody did give you a car. When my car broke down in Nebraska and some girl picked me up and gave me a ride to the gas station and stopped and bought me food. When 
Bobby Lee gave me a hundred dollars. I went up to Bobby one night and go, Bobby, I, I'm broke. And he gave me a hundred dollars out of his pocket. Never asked me for it. Joe Rogan, who hated cocaine, hated cocaine. A couple nights, it got to the point where I needed money. I go, Joe, I need money. He go, <sighs> and he give it to me. Ralphie May, you know, the people who take care of you without you even asking. He mm -hmm. gave you a car. There's so many great lessons I've learned from comedy. So many great fucking lessons that you sit there and go, holy fuck, you know, holy fuck. And here I thought it was going to be this. And look how nice this was, you know. You don't get there by yourself. Never. It's impossible. Never, never. I mean, if you look back of like who got you, you know what I mean, audition for a club or who put in a good word for you. I mean, all the little tiny fucking things, right? You can't just do it by yourself. You need people. You need people that are ahead of you that have some sort of power. And, and that's why I do it now. It's like if you want a commercial agent, I know the dude, my dude, you know, from Aqua. He's a Korean dude. The he Korean. Owns, that's the yeah, man. Yeah, that's yeah, the man yeah. Of steel. Yeah. So it's like, I help, you know, I do it, you know, not because I'm a good person. It's because that's just the way you the thing it. is supposed to fucking work. You know what I mean? You got to help people. Without any young comics... We have nothing. We have nothing. We have nothing. I tell all the time. Those yeah. young comics are going to keep me in chicken cutlets when I'm 70. They're yeah. all going to... When they're all stars, they're going to go, I know who can play my grandpa. This kid, Jack Knight, who I had me op I ha had him open a year ago on in La Brea, a Brea Improv, Comedy Central came out to see me, right? They didn't like my act, but they liked him. He was a kid, black kid, right? He, they gave him like three shows, you know, like you know, Adam Devine's Beach Party, whatever that was, and now Chappelle's using him as an opener. And Jack is like, "Is that all right with me?" I'm like, "Dude, I want, I want you, you to fucking do it." When I saw you a year ago, right? He only had 15 minutes, right? He's 21 years old. He's a cute black, very good writer, right? I'm like, I know it's gonna happen for you. Yeah, so go. Fly, you know. Without them, we got nothing. And that's why when John went crazy, you know what I mean, Caparillo, eight years ago or whatever, you know what I mean. It just baffles me, you know. It was very sad because I saw him when he came into the store, and we were friends. I remember he was a doorman, and one night he kept saying to me, "I don't get spots," and I go, "You know why you don't get spots? Because you don't pay Duncan." He goes, what are you talking about? I go, you got to pay Duncan $15 a spot. He goes, but that's what they pay me. I go, I don't give a fuck. That, you didn't know that? <laughs> Every week on Friday, you got to give Duncan 75 bucks, and he'll give you five spots. I've been doing it for years. Why do you think I get so many spots? <laughs> and Duncan's walking towards me, and I go, Duncan, come here. This yeah. fucking kid don't know. Yeah. They supposed to pay you $15 a spot. He's like, yeah. I go, Every Friday, you got to pay a vig. And you got to give it to me, and I'll give it to Duncan, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And he was going for it. And finally, I gave him a hug. And I go, Cap, this was, and we laughed, and it was hilarious. And, yeah. and then one day he comes up to me and he pulls rank on me. And, and then, yeah. I, you know, that's all that happened. I mean, they already know the listeners. Now, tell me your version of what you I'm just going to tell you what happened, okay? okay? All right. So, John Caparillo's from Ohio. He came off the bus, you know, great family, comes from a great family. But he's a, a white kid, you know, kind of like on the other side of white, which means that he's low economic, you know, and but he's a smart kid, super driven, and he st started dating Shema Tosh, who I lived with. Remember Shema, the Turkish girl? She's now Carrot Top's opener. You remember? Yeah, I yeah. talked to her three weeks ago. Yeah, That's Shema, she's girl. very, very funny. So she was dating um, John, and John, well, here's what happens. When you, when you're nothing... And then all of a sudden, one day, they say, you're something. Sometimes you take that power, right, and it fucks up your brain. So there was a couple of years there where he thought that he was the shit because he was hot. He was one of the best panelists on Chelsea Lately, and he was, his specials were good. And um, it got to his head. I mean, one night he told me that, hey, man, I don't want to do the same show with you at the comedy store, so... Tommy, Tommy's gonna have to figure it out. I go, yeah, there's only one show, dude. So if I'm not doing the same show with you, I'm out. He's like, well, you're not a real comic anyway. That's what he told me. Okay? So in my head, I wanted to fucking take a knife and puncture his throat. You know what I mean? Just go, you know what I mean? Right at his throat. But I'm not a murderer. I'm not gonna do that. Right? So I let it seep. And then Tommy separated us on the lineup for a couple of years. 
And then several years later, he toned down, you know? But that was right around, you know what I mean, when you had a problem with him. So it's just that he's just one of those kids that got something and then it got to his head and he went fucking crazy. Well, you know, the longest yard got to my head. The longest yard got to my head, okay? The movie. Yeah, when, when, when you when, were on when it. When you were there for six weeks and often they put you on for 17 weeks. And you're rubbing shoulders with Adam Sandler and every fucking AD and every producer's telling you when this movie comes out, you're going to fucking hit. It fucks with your head. It fucked with my head a lot. A lot it fucked with my head. Yeah. Not once did I go to the store and bump. Not once did I go to the store and tell a t- talent coordinator I didn't want somebody on the lineup because they were funny to me or they weren't funny to me. That didn't make me do all that craziness. He had this other thing going with Tommy. And I get it. And I get all the other stuff. But the creepy things he did was get in front of somebody's talent. That was the creepy thing he did. Yeah. He did it to you. He did it to Delia. He did it to a couple other guys. And I don't want to beat this horse to death because it's gone. He's done. He's you know he's not gonna fucking fight with me. Yeah. He's not gonna come back at me. I'm not gonna do nothing to him. I just wanted to let him know how I felt. Yeah. That I didn't forget about this. I don't forget about anything. Whether you do something bad to me or whether you do something good to me, I don't yeah. forget about anything. I don't want to beat him up. I don't want to fist fight him. He attacked me, and I just told him he was. A, and and you know what's funny. There are people at the store that are actors that become comics. There are those people. You, my friend, are not one of them. You are not one of them. You were a comedian first. You banged yeah. it out with us yeah, first. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember your little brother coming to the show. Yeah. You know, you banged it out first. You gained the acceptance of your father. This was big for you. This was big for you. You're not some white dude from Orange County. You got to go home and tell your dad, I want to be a fucking comedian. He looked at you and goes, what? Yeah, are yeah, you yeah. fucking retarded? Yeah. Get to some fuck. Go make some kimchi. Or whatever the fuck you're gonna do, but you were thinking, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, this was big for you. This was big for a lot. You know, he just did some things that, yeah, whatever. You know, you're in a bad state of mind. Do I forgive him? I'm done. I don't really give a fuck. Like I told you, man, those people ice themselves. When you do that type of shit, if you don't pay the piper, it starts fucking with your head later on. You know, I know in life, I've paid the fucking pipe. I paid for my sins heavily. Man, when I used to be a thief, my life, yeah, I was snorting coke and getting my dick sucked. But let's look at what really was going on inside. I was living on people's couches. I had no life. I was broken inside. So, bro, you pay for all that I shit. I felt bad when I was using. I gave you so many drugs. I don't give a you fuck. You remember that, though? Fuck yeah. I used fuck. to kill give you just piles of pills and stuff, and I just feel so bad. I'm 14 years sober now, but back in the day, dude, I remember seeing Diaz, and I had to get out my briefcase. And pull it out, you know what I mean? I was a medicine man back then, man. Remember that? You used to sleep in your bathtub and shit? Yeah. I used to sleep in the bathtub because of the sleep apnea. And leave the hot water on all night and just sleep in the tub and let the water hit me so I could breathe. And you would be able to sleep with the water on? Oh, I love sleeping with water on. What if I, I get a pillow and put a garbage bag on it. Is this a relapse? Because I've been 14 years sober. If I, I'm fine with it, but this is not, open I'm not, the door. Open no, 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 don't, 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 don't look at over no, no, Open the door. Open the door. Yeah, no, 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 it's fine. It's already happened. It's, I didn't mean it's to dissipated. Do this. No, I didn't no, it's mean. fine. It's fine. You know what I mean? I'm not buzzed. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> but can you get high like that though? Uh, maybe with his stuff, but not. I don't. I think you'll be fine. All right. Thank you. Like how? Like is it hard? Because you could both have had pretty great careers. Like. I know you're not done, but you've had good things happen to you. Is it hard not to start being like, oh, I'm going to bump all these people at the store. I'm going to do all that. Like, it must. Some people... Why would I want to do that? I, why would I call in on a Monday? They gave me 15 fucking minutes. That's enough time. Sometimes I'll do 20, you know, and then I'm out. Why would I? They'll give me my spot. I called in today. They're going to give me a spot pretty much every night. If they, there's one night, they might not, but that's fine. And I'll just do it. And that's it. Why would I go mysteriously, unannounced, and then go up to a kid, you know what I mean, who's struggling, and go, by the way, me and Joey are going to bump you, and you're not going to go on for another hour. Why would I do that? I think it's the same, you could say the same thing, like, why do these bankers defraud people? Like, it's, you could make the argument that it's just never enough for some people. There's never enough money. There's never enough stage time. Yeah. I, I, but also, I think the comedy stores run in a way that you can't do that anymore, really. I mean, the guy, I'll tell you who can bump. And the, it's only a handful. Louis C.K., Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, Bill Burr, maybe Sarah Silverman because she'll just, she's, you know, who she is. And she'll only do 10 minutes anyway. You know what I mean? But that's pretty much it. And I have no problem with that. Yeah, me either. I have no problem. Rogan, with that. Rogan can do it. I have no problem with that, and he won't now. 
He won't do he it, won't but do he it. could. But if Bill Bill has come up to me, Burr, and <coughs> Chappelle or whatever, and they said, hey, can I go up before you? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I, I don't care. You know, because it's not like what they used to do in the 90s. When Eddie Griffin used to do three hours. Do you remember that shit? Oh, my God. Three hours. Andrew? Dice would do three hours. So that, that would mean that if you had a 945 spot, you're not getting up. You would literally, you, you would literally see Dice's car pull up. And you would and, just leave. Or, yeah, but not just leave. You would scream, right, and throw something. Oh, fuck! You know what I mean? And then you would get in the car and then leave. Because you had no spot. No money. And you wanted that 15 bucks. That you needed 15 the $15. Bucks. $15, you counted on that so 15 They, they wouldn't give it to you if you got bumped? No, no because they wanted you to stay and wait. Yeah. So unless you stayed and wait two and a half hours. I mean, Eddie Griffin would go on at 10 and stay on until fucking 10 to 2. And then Say go, I what? I left you a little something. Yeah. What would he say for three hours? Well, he you would know, talk about no for an idea. hour how he was Jesus one night. <laughs> for two hours, he was trying to convince the room that he was literally Jesus Christ. You know, and it wasn't jokes. I'm Jesus. And that's it. I'll tell you why. You know what I mean? It's like, what? And that would and they would let that, you know what I mean, happen. And that's why industry never came. That's why the real credible comics never wanted to play there. But now everyone plays there because it's run fairly. And it's a it's the best room in LA. It's right? By far. By far. By far. By like far. when Flappers, check this out. When did Flappers come out? Five years ago? Five years ago. Okay, so this is what happens. I get the call from the lady. What's her lady's name? Barbara. Barbara, right? She calls me, goes, hi, left a message. Hi, I'm Barbara. I'm opening up a comedy club called Flappers. And um, I remember you from back in the day, you know what I mean, from my visits at the comedy store. And I would like you to perform at my room. I called her immediately and I said, I'd love to do it. So you have weekends? She goes, well, you're not a weekend guy. I go, excuse me? Yeah, I'm having Jimmy Dore and, you know, these names on it. And Avi Lieberman, you know, they're the, the headliners and they're doing the weekends. You're more of a Tuesday call in, you know what I mean? And I'm like, bitch, I'm with CAA. Bitch. You know what I mean? I got, I've done movies and TV shows, bitch. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. I go, okay. <laughs> That's what I said. Okay, and then I hung up, right? But it's like, I will never play that room. And then a year later, she left another message. I'm so sorry. You can do a weekend. How do I, you know what I mean? But at that point, done. Fucking done. I, will, I have stepped in that room maybe twice in my life just because my girlfriend was performing the open mic there because she wanted to try stand-up. And I had another friend do open mic, whatever. I, I stopped. I was by. there last Tuesday. At open mic? No, and uh, they do a Tuesday. Oh, they night do? Yeah, yeah. Thing, and I was there on Tuesday and went. Have you ever done a weekend there? One time, I did the Friday night. Well, there you go. But I never did it again. Nice club, but I just don't Why? need to do it. Yeah, yeah. Why? It's not good, right? It's a good club, and they get good people, and it's Burbank. Uh, I just thought that the whole thing wasn't worth the aggravation. Like I got fucking, you know, Dead Squad people don't buy tickets till Friday. They're stoners. <laughs> and she kept calling me Wednesday and Tuesday, like, you're not selling tickets. You got to give away tickets. And I'm like, I ain't giving away dick. Cancel me. And then uh, Friday, she came in and apologized. She goes, hey, man, when I got here today, there was a bunch of stoners out there waiting to buy <laughs> tickets and shit. And she's a nice lady. It's a great club. It's just not what we're used to. And there's a lot of clubs that we're not meant for, Bobby Lee. And we go there one time. Uh, and you know when you walk in, you're like, ooh, this is not me. I, I, I've literally gone up to club owners and said, this is a nice club. Don't ever ask me back. No, you have. I have. This is the worst weekend of my life. No, you have. I have. I don't give up because I don't even want them to call my agent to even see. One of the guys at Kansas City, right? He was a Christian. The right? wig or the club? Improv club. Improv. Oh. Right? He's a Christian. And when I told him that, he goes... Can you get on your knees and pray with me? I go, what? So we get on our knees. He goes, he, I, it wasn't a joke. He goes, dear Lord, please open Bobby's heart, you know, to this club. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I got up, I got back on my two feet. And I, 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 I he was holding my hand. It was sweaty. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it was like vibrating and it was sweaty. And I got up and I go, dude, this is the fucking reason. <laughs> 
this is the reason I don't want to come back here. Was it just too clean? It's just the I, I, one show. A lady stood up, and I didn't even know what this word meant. I had to Google it. She goes, "Heathen!" Never heard it before in my life. I in go, the middle he- of Kansas City, they just called you a heathen. Yeah, I go heathy. I didn't know what the fuck it meant. I, I'm, I'm retarded. I didn't know what it meant, and then I Googled it. And I go, "That fucking cunt." <laughs> I ain't no fucking heathen, you know. And as soon as that happened, I got to never come to this fucking place again. Was the food good? Was the club good? good? Yeah, yeah, the hotel good. was yeah, good? Yeah, the hotel was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you just didn't like the club. You know, dude, it's like if it's a lot of white people, like 99.9% white, I generally can't play it. Do you know why? Why? Because of a cultural connection. If I play Seattle, 30% of my room are mixed, either Asian, black, Latino, Latino right? And if I talk about my, my parents or my upbringing, and if it's all white people, they just don't get it. I mean, the jokes, because it's constructed where I have a punchline, right? They do giggle at it, right? But it's not that, like, caca, caca, where like, I really know what you're talking about. And I just don't want to do I don't want to convince people, you know what I mean, of who I am. You know what I mean? It's like I just played Cleveland and I I'll play I only play that room because of Nick, the owner Nick is of great. Hilarity. He's one of the best people I've ever met. Best, the best. And the audience is they, I, I sold out, you know what I mean? And the audiences are great, you know what I mean? But it's hard. It's hard. Like every show I have to walk on and they go, You kill. I go, I don't know. I, you know I had a hard time there too. Yeah, in I the middle, hard, I lost yeah. him a little bit. You lose yeah, him yeah, a little yeah. Bit. Yeah, that's when tough. I was talking about my purple nut sack, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, and how yeah. ethnic guys have purple nut sacks and stuff. And they're like, ours is pink. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, but mine is purple. I don't believe you. You know what I mean? It's that kind of thing. Where if there's ethnic people there, go, yeah, dog, my, mine's purple too, or whatever. You know what I mean? Where else have you played that you don't like the club? <laughs> this is what? great. What? Where else? Okay, you? so they're Pittsburgh. Oh, my God. Steve Byrne told me to play because he's from there. Right. Yeah, you're from there. You're going to do, and you're also half white, right? I'm full Asian. I went there. I mean, you're talking about 60 people on a Friday for a show. You know what I mean? It's like, you know what I mean? I'm swinging 500 seats sold out at Irvine Improv, right? Schaumburg Improv, sell out every show. Right? How's Schaumburg? You like Amazing. Schaumburg? Amazing. You like Schaumburg? Yeah, okay. because it's close enough to Chicago, and there's just, you know, the cultural element is there. Canada, I fucking love. Canada's the fucking best everywhere in Canada. But there's some place, oh, you know what the worst one was? Denver Improv. Have you played there? Yes. Oh, my guy. That was the worst. You know what happened to me there? Why didn't you like the Denver Improv? I'll tell you one night. I, okay, I do a Thursday show, Friday show, in front of like 40 people, a show. I'm not fucking kidding you. Saturday, first show, I walk in the club. The doorman put me in a headlock. He put me in a black guy. He put me in a headlock. He goes, yo, dog, where's your ticket? I swear to fucking God. And on your third night there? Yeah, it's my third night. I go, I'm the headliner. And he let me go. He's like, my bad. Bitch, you're supposed to fucking know that already. You know what I mean? It's not like we're, you know, it's not like a movie complex. Was it next to your poster at the front door? Well, it's not like there's 12 comics in 12 different rooms. You know what I mean? It's one room, one guy playing the whole weekend, right? Know who that guy is. The same happened to me in Seattle, and I got him fired. In Seattle, I did two shows. I walked in a cl- club, American Indian, long hair, braids, a bull, you, you, you sold out. I go, I'm the headliner. And when I got off the stage, he was fired. I didn't say to fire him, they just did it because it's embarrassing. But then I got him his job back the next day. <laughs> I felt bad, because he had kids and stuff. And he's American Indian, you know what I mean? Yeah, but how can you not know? How you can should you know fucking who the know who is? your fucking headliner is. So it's Denver out. I, I went to Comedy Works. You know? That's the shit. You know what I mean? Pittsburgh out. Never again. I, I'll tell people. I love you people in Pittsburgh. If you're listening right now, but I can't play that room again. It's a disaster. <sighs> you know, here's another one. Fucking, I can't play fucking Dallas with, uh, that, with Addison Improv. Why not? I just it's 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 chaos. There's a beer thrown on the stage, you know what I mean? A girl has her titty out in the front row. 
That's a crazy room. Yeah. And it used to be crazy 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, that's a like, crazy titty fucking o- room. Put your titty away. <laughs> that's I'm a trying- white neighborhood, Addison. Yeah. It's next to a karaoke bar. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. It's like, that, you know, the dueling pianos. The dueling piano. Yeah, dueling piano. So it gets all those knuckleheads in. Because if you go to a dueling piano, you decide to get hit in the head with a fucking piano. Wait, it's in the same room? At- right next door, so you hear the piano and shit. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it's a great. Cl- I, I've always had fun at the Dallas Improv. I it's a go- good room. I just did room. never made any fucking money, and I'm done with it. I tried it ten fucking times, and I'm done with it. The- Houston, I kill it. It's so weird. Like some places you do really. Austin. Right? Oh my god, I can't even fucking believe you just brought that up, dude. How's Austin? I'm gonna tell you something that happened to me in Austin, and I can't even believe you just said that because, and it's the mo- it's an atrocity, right? And I'm going to sue. I might sue. I was playing Austin a year ago, okay, on the books. Matt Blake calls me. He goes, you're out of, you're, a, week, a weekend, right? You're out of Austin. I go, why? Because Rich Miller called me and said that the year before, you were in a limo with the limo driver. You pulled your dick out, and you told the limo driver to suck your dick. <laughs> That's what he said. Did you? No. What, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Right? I go, excuse me, Matt. First of all, when have I ever been in a fucking limo? And number two, Nick Youssef, my opener, was with me every second of every day. I never fucking did that. Why would I do that? I'm sober. Right? I go, give me Rich Miller's number. Rich Miller is Dennis Miller's brother. Right, right, right. Who, no, they don't know the people oh. listening, right? So P- Rich Miller is Dennis Miller's brother, and he books comedy rooms, right? And he lives in Minnesota. I don't know the fucking guy, right? I call Rich Miller. He answers. I go, dude, I never pulled my dick out and told some white limo driver to suck my dick. I'm not gay. And also, I'm sober. Like, I'm in the AA. I have a sponsor. You know what I mean? I pray. I meditate. Why the fuck? Would I do that? He goes, I don't know anything about that. I double booked you, right? I double booked you, and it's the other guy's a friend of mine. He has no money, but I'll get you back on the books. That's what the fucking guy tells me, right? I hang up the phone. I call Matt. I go, that's what Rich said. He didn't even mention the dick sucking thing, right? So then Matt called Rich again. Matt calls me back. He goes, yeah, you did it. The dick sucking. So the Rich Miller can't say it to my face. He lies to me on my face, right? And then tells my agent that I did it. I never did it. And then I had my manager and my lawyer call the club itself to bypass Rich. They won't answer our phone calls. I don't know what the fuck happened there. I love that fucking room. That's a great room. I know it is! I know it's a great room, but I never... Why would I... Why would I tell a stranger, a guy, to suck my dick? I know. I okay, listen. Listen to me right now. Okay. Okay. Ask me if I've ever sucked a dick before. Have you sucked a dick? Yes. Whoa. <laughs> I have. When? In high school. Why? I'm, because I was drunk. I'm not gonna tell you who it was. With a buddy, he pulled his dick out, and I was now not high school. I was like maybe eighth to ninth grade. Okay. Eighth to ninth grade. Okay. Okay. Did he finish? Did he no, no, no. I just tasted it a couple times. I didn't like it. it was salty. <laughs> right? So check it out. So I sucked it. All right? I'm willing to admit every fucking awful, dirty thing I've ever fucking done. I'm not, I'm not a fucking angel. I've made mistakes. I've been in and out of sobriety. I've relapsed before. I know my frailties. And I know exactly <coughs> what I've done in my fucking life. All right? If you've asked, you know, when they say, were you molested by a guy with Down syndrome? Yes. He stuck his little sweaty fingers in my butthole when I was nine. And he gave me candy, and I went back every fucking day for three summers in a row to get that candy. (laughs) And I let him stick his fucking sweaty fingers in my butthole, and I jerked him off. I don't give a fuck. I want the fucking dip candy. You know, he had the dip, you know, with the stick? Right, right. Right. So I went back, you know what I mean, every day for three summers in a row to get my candy. What was it going on during the school year? What? You, why, why do you only go during because, the summer? Because he, he was the guy that mowed the lawn at the fucking skating rink during the summer, and then during the winter it was, so he never lived there, but in the summer he was like the, the groundsman. 
right? So it was only in the summer. And he lived in the shack there, right? And he had this candy on the rafters. I'm just telling you this right now because of the fact that it's a dark thing, but it's like I'm, I'll admit to it, all right? Well, you know, I've, I've told my parents every dirty thing I've ever fucking done. And I've done many, all right? And I've apologized for bad things, but I never pulled my dick out to a limo driver and told him to suck my dick. That never fucking happened. And then I'm banned from a room, and then I wanted to sue, and then my agent's like, Dad, I do business with them, with my other clients. You know, he was with CAA, so i like, can you not? I mean, I'll, I'll back you up. So I let it go. But I'm telling you right now, Rich Miller, I never fucking did that shit, and you should be a fucking ashamed of yourself. Okay? People, and listen, in 98, I went to Florida. 97, summer of 97, I went to West Palm Beach when it was the old club. I got there Wednesday. I headlined Wednesday. Headlined Thursday and Friday, Saturday. The black chick from Night Court was headlining. Marshall Warfield. Marshall Warfield. This is before she died. I love you. And this is before she died. And that Saturday. She died? I think she died. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh, that Saturday, that Friday, I, I mean, I had people in Miami, and I bought Blow in Miami that Friday. And then that Thursday, I got high. But that Saturday, I was talking to the waitress, and the waitress comes over to me, and I go, hey, man, can you get some Blow? And she goes, yeah. So I go, how much? 90 whatever. I give her the buck money. 20 minutes later, the club manager comes, and he goes, hey, man, don't ever ask my waitress for Blow again. I mean, she had given it to me already. Yeah. He goes, next time, come to me. That's not where I thought you were going with it. <laughs> yeah. I go, I didn't know. Nobody fucking sent me the memo. You know, next time I'll go to you. Yeah. Okay. That Sunday night, whoever the club owner was, I don't need to mention his name, I do the early show at 7. The fucking show finishes at 8.30. Do you know at 11 o'clock I still wasn't paid because he was doing blow in the green room with whoever the fuck, some other, one of the other headliners, and I could even smell the free basin, Okay. I bought the gram of Coke. I got high. I didn't get high at the club. I didn't hit on any of the waitresses. I got high at my cousin's Friday, whatever. Saturday, I got high in the hotel. You could, the condo was so bad. The condo didn't even have a fucking a shower curtain. I mean, I had to stay with my cousin. The point of the story is I came home, and three months later, some headliner comes up to me. He goes, hey, man, what would you do in West Palm Beach? That owner will hate you. He says you were doing fucking blow. Okay, the owner was doing blow on Saturday and Sunday fucking night in the green room with the other comic that was at the other. Because yeah. they had Davey and they had whatever. Doesn't really matter who the fuck it was, but it's amazing how people will say shit. And it depends how we take it. I was very insulted. And I saw him after that. And I never talked to him again. Ever since then, things have changed. And now when I see him, he's my best friend and he wants to talk and you're doing great. But it's fucking crazy. Yeah, I was at the store one night in the very beginning, 97, and I went to the door guy, and I asked him for blow. And I gave him 100 bucks, and he gave me 620s for 100. So I had 620s. I think I had an audition the next morning. I was going to do two of them. I had four of them that I would have given away. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I do a couple bumps. A comic comes in there, well-known comic, comes in. I just met him, and he goes, hey, man, I'm fucking exhausted. I go, you want a blast? He goes, yeah. I give him two blasts, and I go, hey, take one of the packages. Do you know a month later, he went to a pitch meeting, and my name came up, and the guy called me a coke fiend? No. After I gave wait, him the package. Wait, 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 wait. A famous guy? Yeah, pretty much. You're not going to name him? No. Are you friends with this famous he guy? He apologized now? since then, because I hit him up. Yeah. He did? Yeah, he hit him. I would have fucking killed him. Years later, I told I him. He fucking... asked me what happened. When it comes to industry, dude. Oh, my God. Somebody should've... fucks you with industry, oh, dude. Oh, he had tears in his eyes. He, he did had, that? Oh, he had. Oh, I, my, I, I was going to kill him for you just now. Because I was really mad when I was telling him. Like, I, it hurt my feelings. I said, that's what I get for dealing with fucking Gentiles, and I'll never do it again. And I le- But it's really weird, because... Years later, I've heard stories where people were coke fiends with people, and when they hit, they stopped talking to those people. Like, I know a lot of people that have done coke with certain celebrities, and that's why I always took never to do coke with people, because they'd stop talking to you. So that's why that's what I learned real quick in 98, that never do blow with people. Like, I sold blow to somebody one day, like a well-known agent called me one day. He was at the store and became friends, and he called me one day out of the blue, and he goes, hey, man, can you get me blow? And I said, yeah. 
So go meet me at El Compadre. I'm the blowing like an hour later. He called me back that it wasn't what he wanted. He want, and I'm like, hey. And then he never talked to me again. Like you know oh. what I'm saying? So it was weird. And then I heard like there was this guy. I I knew this guy at karate on Sunset Boulevard. He was a big guy. And I used to talk to him after karate and shit. And one day he goes, can I buy you a beer? And we went over. And I became friends with the guy, and he showed me this. This is a great story. We went to back after about three months. One night, he goes, let's go back to my house and smoke a joint. Went back to his house. He goes, I want to show you something. And he started showing me fucking pictures of him in 1995 and 96 with a bunch of guys with blow everywhere and the beach behind them. He and took he, pictures of blow? Like he just showed pictures of people partying. You know when you're yeah. doing blow and there's women and, and there's mirrors and there's lines on it? And one, of the, and one of the guys that was in every picture was James Gandolfini. God bless his soul. Wow. And he told me a very interesting story. He goes, I was with that guy for two years every weekend. He was part of a clique that came down to party on the beach. They all lived in Hollywood. And they would come down to party on the beach. On the, and they would get pills and drugs and whatever. And, and Gandolfini was one of those guys. And he goes, I became good friends with him. He goes, I remember driving him to the set of the movie with the boat. What's the movie with Denzel and Gene Hackman on the boat? That movie they made when uh, the, the mutiny and shit like that. That was James Gandolfini's big. Like James started working, and he started booking like Get Shorty. When Travolta beats him up, he did a bunch. So he goes, I still remember him driving him to that set. Wow. You know, like I was talking and him being hung Crimson up. Tide. Crimson Tide. Crimson Tide. And us being. What year was that? Ninety five. Eighty five. Eight. Oh, no, nine, I'm sorry. Ninety five. And he goes, I remember him, you know, driving him and having a conversation with him. And, and this guy was a big Italian guy. And he goes that he remembers one weekend talking to him and him going, I'm going to New York to shoot a pilot for some mafia show. It's not going to get picked up. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. not going to get picked up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, he goes, I'm going to miss you guys and shit. But they got to go to New York. Well, the show got picked up. Yeah. And he goes, one day I called Gandolfini. He goes, I got his number from one of my friends. And I said, hey, Jimmy, it's fucking whatever. This guy since then died. And he goes, uh, Jimmy, it's whatever. Listen, man, the Sopranos are looking for this role. Can you help me out? He goes, bro, I love you to all my heart. He goes, that was a long time ago, man. I really can't help you. Good luck. And he hung up on him. Wow. And he goes, Gallifini wasn't a bad guy. But he just didn't want me on the set with bad fucking habits, the yeah. same bad habits he had. Yeah. He goes, I figured that out a year later. I bumped into him. He didn't want him on the set. Jimmy told him to his face. He goes, bro, I had enough problems on my own. You know, I'm, I'm having enough hard time in New York on my own. Yeah. Every place I walk into, somebody wants to give me a Coke rock. Now I need you to fucking <laughs> come up to me and fucking hang out with me. So Plus, I mean, how often do you guys get hit up by friends who you can't help everybody out? But at least he had the, the also balls to also say no. but also a set though it's like uh, it's a it's a workplace right and it's like you don't need it's also stressful he's the star of the show correct and he's got lines to memorize the last thing you need is an element that's like a little weird it's like in the eight years I was on Mad TV no one came I had my dad come one time you know what I mean like I just it's my job you know what I mean it's like people are like hey can I get tickets. No. What do you want to come for? I have to work. You know? <laughs> oh, shit. You know, it's a really interesting statement you made before. Because you can't get to this place by yourself. Like, I remember having no credits and going into, like, a, you're going to love this, having basketball and having a pilot and having a commercial. But I needed that TV show. I just fucking needed that TV show. And I got a call one day. Hey, man. Mad TV's doing a sketch about the Sopranos. Go in there. Just go down there. And I made some calls, and I found out the office where it was, and I fucking went down there because they submitted me too late. So they go, just go down there and crash the audition. And when I get there, they stop seeing people. There was nobody there. But who walked out of the fucking office that was writing? The black kid. Aries. Aries. Aries Spears with the impersonations. You know how many times Aries Spears talked to me before then? <laughs> Zero. He would see me at the store and go, "What's up, brother?" Do you want to you know how many times he said hi to me at eight years of on the show with him? Zero. Okay, but here's the thing: he said hello to me zero times at the store. I yeah. would do Freaky Monday with him and the other guy, the Black Show. But guess what? When he walked out of that door, he made eye contact with me, and he walked over and he goes, "You here for the Soprano bit?" 
And I go, yeah, and he goes, hold on one minute. And he knocked on the door. He went in. I could tell everybody the truth, you know. Yeah, yeah. He walked in, and he came out. He came out with some lady, and he introduced me to the main lady. And he goes, Nicole Garcia? Yeah, he goes, yeah, this yeah. my motherfucker from the store. You know, give me some love and shit. And I went in there and booked it. Wow. You know, a, a grudge match. I got a call from the director. You know, think of all the things that we've booked just because we've known somebody. Yeah. Meanwhile, when you were a kid and you were starting comedy, you're like, how did he get that role? I wonder how many times he auditioned. Yeah. If people at home really knew that, after a while, you just develop relationships. I went to an audition last week, and there was a bunch of old Italians in there, and they were talking about Hollywood in the 80s and 90s. And they were talking about when casting people in the old days would call you and go, I didn't book this. Like, I, like you know how many people would want to book a pilot? Guess what? 15 years ago, I was in my house about to go get coke. I swear to God. And I got a call from Julie Ashton Ooh. at 6.45 at night. She goes, Joey, what are you doing tonight? And I go, nothing. I got a spot. And she goes, can you go to Fox? I forgot to cast the part on the pilot. NYPD Blue, 2069. She goes, we'll negotiate in the morning, but I'm going to take care of you. Just go and do this for me, please. And I went and I had two lines, and I fell and I got shot, and the pilot never got picked up. But that was one of many opportunities yeah. that people just called me up. That's how it was. I think I got like eight grand for a fucking phone call yeah. the night before. You know how much I needed that fucking eight grand? So if you put the work in somewhere along the line, cause just because you want something doesn't mean you'll get that. But you'll get something else if you put the work in. Can I tell you another stuff? So this is, and this is a little why you should be nice to people, okay? So I was if, if you twist that, it'll stop on Where? the side. Where, right here? Oh, no, the little knob, it'll stop falling off. Why can't you do it? Why can't you be nice and do it for me? Like that? Thank you. So I was a doorman right at the comedy store, and this lady was hanging around, like walking around the parking lot. And I go, hey, lady. What, you need anything? She goes, I hate this club. They're always so rude. Because remember back then when, like, the do Harris P, they were so fucking rude. Right, the Chewy, those Yeah, Chewy, those guys. She, she didn't know what to do, so I go, you know what? I'll get you in. So I snuck her on the back, right? I got her a seat. And then I didn't have any money at the time, but she looked like somebody with power. And she seemed nice, so I go, I, I, I got her a, a wine. She sat there. She saw whoever she needed to see. And then she, afterwards she goes, she was an agent at Gersh at the time. And she goes, uh, what's your name? I go, my name is Bobby Lee, right? Two years later, I'm testing for Mad TV. And she attended. She's now an executive. And she attended my, my test, my audition. And she said afterwards that she was only there for me to get my job. Because I was so nice to her two years before. That night. Yeah. It, like, it was the weirdest cosmic experience. I mean, I got to that point by doing 12 auditions and I, I mean I you know what I mean I did the work but that last final thing that lady was just sitting there you know what I mean and you everything helps you know and like she really that was amazing it was a big lesson to just be nice to everyone you fucking know you see is it hard for you I growing up I used to hate in school when there used to be group projects I used to I used to always be like I'll just do it by myself I, like, I couldn't trust other people. I didn't like working with them. And hearing all you say, like, even now, like, we had this guy, Kevin, very nice, help us with the studio. It's gotten to the point where, especially, I don't even know if it's his town, but you start becoming, like, a little bit wary of people who are trying to be nice or, or want to work with you. And it's nice to hear that not everybody is, is out to, like, there are people actually trying to help and being nice. And it's, did it, like, did it take you a while to get to that place of accepting help and working with other people? Well, I mean, I, I think maybe it's an innate thing that you're born with. I really don't. I, it's not something that you consciously decide. I'm, in my head, I'm like, you just feel it in your heart to be nice, and then you are. I mean, I mean, and let me tell you something. I've had years where I was a fucking asshole, and I didn't help anybody. I mean, I thought I was the shit. But you know what? I've suffered I mean, there were some years after Mad TV where I was the, I, 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 nobody wanted me for many years. And you, you either go, you know, become bitter and sad and angry, or you change and you become a better person, like your parents taught you. You know, so it's like I've decided to just be as nice as I can, you know? I've never denied a photograph, have you? No. Yeah, if, if I'm at a restaurant, I'm Before eating. shows, I do. 
Like, but when I get to a thing before a show, because I don't want everybody taking pictures. Before. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I do afterwards. Especially you're in the sh- you're walking through the showroom and right. some it's, guy in the back. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to do them afterwards. So of course. But if you're at a restaurant, right, and somebody goes, "Can I get a phone or a waiter?" You would say yes, yes right? Yes, always. Because there are a lot of cocksuckers that won't, right? It's like I'm, you know, if somebody wants to talk to me about something, I will talk. You know, what I mean, if they ask me, "Hey, well, how did this?" You know, I like this sketch. I'll talk to them about it, even though I don't want to. You know what I mean? But it's like, yeah, I, I feel like I've changed and I'm more available, you know what I mean, for stuff like that. I think you have to be. I remember when I started in Denver, the big thing that they had was running the light. And I couldn't figure it out at first. I went home on that bus a couple of nights and I thought about it. And it's weird even at the store today. As soon as the light gets on, I get off. And people always say to me, you know, you have a couple few minutes after that. I don't care. Because I want people to understand how I am. You know what the first thing I do when I get home is from the road? When I pull up in front of my house, I go upstairs. I take my luggage. I throw the clothes in. I put my sleep apnea mask on. I go in. I take a shower. And I come out. You know what that, the next thing I do is? I write a check for the commission. And I send it the next day. Because mm. I don't want no fucking problems with my money. Mm-hmm. Okay? When I got money, I don't want you taking fucking 30 days to mail me a fucking check. Yeah. I send you your fucking money. That's the respect that I give people. And I tell them. When they go, wow, I got a check from you. Two weeks in a row, I go, you know why? Because I don't want no misunderstanding with my fucking money either. So when you have your money, I don't want it in your fucking pocket to get interest for three weeks. Mail me my fucking money. <laughs> I don't want to wait for the account on Wednesday. Because the first time I wait for your account on Wednesday, I'm going to make you wait for my account. And he only comes once a year. <laughs> okay? You don't yeah. want that, do you? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't wait for accounts. Send me my fucking money on Thursday and I'll send you a fucking check. Yeah. I don't give a fuck if you don't put the check in the bank. Don't. You know what I was doing the last couple of years when I book a job? I'd show up there and give them the commission before the job was even shut. Don't touch my money. Don't touch my money. I don't want the 10 days and the 10 you got. By the time I get the check, it's 25 days later. Why? Because you guys want interest on what, $800? Just give me the fucking money. What do you do in a situation where at a club and you know that you did better than, you know what I mean, they say you did? You know what I mean, in terms of money? Like, do you say things or do you just let it go? In the beginning, I got pissed. And then I realized why I pay my agent. And even though I go home on that flight a little pissed, like I got smacked in the face, first thing I do when I get home is I fucking go off on my agent and go get me my fucking money right now. Right. In fact, here's my, I email him with my bank account. Just tell him to deposit the money. I don't even fuck around. It's mm-hmm. already, so when they call me back and they go, I already, I email, I assume the clothes. You rip me off, I assume the clothes. Like I'm about to work a club in a few weeks ago that this was the only club that came to me. Right now, in Charlotte, right now. You want me to tell you what the numbers are for the week in Charlotte? I'll tell you right now for mm-hmm. my week in Charlotte. Just so you know how I sell, you're gonna die. Okay? Because I got no reason to lie to anybody. Just so people go, oh, well, Joey fucking lied or whatever. This is what I have. Trash. Let's see. Where the fuck is this? Now, with my luck, it's not in this. Com- no, it's not. Because I, I, I will erase another thing. I got 70 for the first show. Thursday night. I got uh, 118 or something. I got 700 tickets sold. I think 60 for the first show on Amazing. Saturday. You know what the second show is on Saturday? What? 256. Amazing. Already. 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 Just I always sell out Saturday late show first. That goes first. You know what? This club owner came to me and said, man, your Saturday late show is looking bad. I just let him. I didn't say nothing to him. <laughs> you know me. I let him fall into his own trap. Yeah. I said, really? I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you've only got like 30 seconds sold for the last show. He goes, so I had to do a group on, two for one. But don't worry, it'll be packed tomorrow night. And I looked him straight in the face and I said, I'm sure it will be. (laughs) And this guy thought he had me till Monday. And I fucking called every, I called the higher ups, I called everybody and go, because I got all those emails. I got those emails. And yeah. I sent them to the fucking office. And I said, listen, this guy's not getting away with this. And sure enough, there was a mistake. Because there always is. Yeah, I'm cowardly when it comes to that. No, I just don't get in people's faces. I just let no, them. If they, I if, let the Jew If call. they say, you know, hey, and I know different, I don't say nothing. Because I feel like if I make a stink, that they'll never have me back there. Well, fuck it. But you, I'm getting my money. 
I don't give a fuck if you don't. I don't want to do a deal. I don't listen. Why would you want to deal with me if I'm fucking your money ever again? Give my money. I won't ever come back here again. You go fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself. If you're fucking me on money, we know now. We could go into a room right now and we could tell you what's in that room and be off by 20. And we know our own trends. We're economists. We know. Yeah. Listen, for you to have a great weekend, you got to have 150 people in there on a Thursday night. With the pictures from Twitter and stuff, you'll pack it up. If you have 70 people on Thursday, it's going to be a rough weekend. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. it's Monday. I'm not worried about your radio, blah, 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 blah. But don't come to me and tell me that that is on a, that's on a Saturday late show. You made a big mistake. And I got every dime. Yeah. I got every dime. Yeah. I'm a fucking Cuban Jew. I got every dime white to met you. In fact, they even sent the guy a shirt. The agent sent the guy a shirt that said, what would Joey Diaz do? <laughs> <laughs> really? <coughs> yeah, we know. Yeah. I'm not in business to get robbed. I don't want to rob you, and I don't want you robbing me. All right, all right there's 20 chairs you don't call. But even that, that's fucking $200. It's $400. If you get a the door deal, yeah, 20 chairs at $20. 20 times 20 is 400 I think I got buzzed from the thing. That's okay. Just drink some water. Put yeah, some Tony better on. I think I got buzzed a little bit from the thing. Nah. You're fine. You're Are you sure? Yeah, you're because I'm sweating. I'm sweating and stuff. Oh, it's hot in here. Oh. I'm sweating like fucking uh, Lee the other day when I showed him the hit acid. What's this? And what's he, Tony Bennett all about? It's just a nice little sweet song that calms things down. We're almost in the home stretch here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Look at you in H Town on Valentine's Day and shit. Fuck it How'd up. How'd you know that? Because I know everything. Hey, can I plug a couple of things, man? You can plug whatever you want, but wait till the end of the show. You don't need to plug it now. I'm going to plug it for you. You're a fucking star, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I, what's going on? Just sitting here relaxing. Uh, oh. Going to smoke some more pot here. Let me open up the door and get some air in here. There's no noise up here. Oh, God almighty. So how you doing, Bobby? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. As soon as we open the door, police siren shows up. You know what I'm saying? This is a nice place, man. Very nice. I got this on the way back. I was walking with the baby, and the guy came out. And he goes, hey, you came in here for an office about a year ago. You still interested? We got an office opened up. So we were going to do it. I called Kevin, and I said, can you just come in and give us some advice in the office? This motherfucker came in here and took over. Yeah. He started building shit. All so I this did was brick right here, you, they did that? Kevin did that. He hung the TV. We had the TV, obviously. Holy Kevin painted shit. everything. Kevin helped uh, my man here, Lee, hang the cameras. It's something that you go home and you're like, why is somebody being so nice? And after being around them, I get it. I get it. You know, there's some people who are just genuinely nice in this town. And we don't expect it. Right. Because we know it always comes with something. You know what I'm saying? It always my card's always up or something. Yeah, it comes with a by the way of, hey, man, we want you to do this gig or something. Whatever. He's just been really cool. And I'm trying to find a way to pay him back. But I know he's one of those guys that uh, he puts it in the karma box. Yeah. You know, some people fill up the karma box. Do you believe, do you believe in karma? Yes, I do. I've lived it. I'm living proof of karma. Yeah, but can I ask you something then? Go ahead. Then how come, like... Um, like guys like George W. Bush, nothing bad happens to him. Something bad happens to him. We just don't know it. No, he's playing golf and stuff. Something bad happens to him every day when he has to face himself at the end of the night. That's yeah. when karma shows up. Yeah, but he like started a bunch of illegal wars and a lot of people died and stuff. Trust like, me, think... he'll pay for it. At he some deserves point. AIDS and stuff. At some point, it's, it's so... like I remember when I, when I robbed this guy. and I. And I and <laughs> You're never I, getting back into Texas robbed, now. And I robbed 18-5. Like, what I made from the scam was eighteen five. You know what? I ended up paying the attorney $18,000. i will never forget that, looking at the bills and going. Well, you got caught. I made 500 bucks. Like, this is God sending me a bill. Like, I made five. Like, God making me realize that I made $500 for two years of my life. Because I know you've beaten a man with a pipe before. No, no, I didn't beat nobody with no pipe. You know, you've never beaten anybody with a pipe no, before? No, 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 no. Yeah, I think you have. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. You told me one time that you no, beat a man no. with a pipe. I must have smacked him with a two-by-four <laughs> yeah, yeah, a pipe. Yeah. That's a big you difference. You never, like, beaten a guy to almost death with a pipe before? No. You no. <laughs> Yes, you have. No, I haven't. No, I haven't. You got the wrong well, guy. Yeah, you're the wrong guy? Yeah, yeah. You've yeah. never violently attacked anybody before? Not with a pipe. No, with what? 
I got into fights. Some guy jumped me and he had a two by four. And I took it from him, hit him with him one time. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I hit a guy with a Heineken bottle when I was 18. He was a man, though. <laughs> yeah. He was a fucking man, you know? He yeah. was a real fucking man. He had another friend who was a man and we were scared. Uh, but you've never taken a pipe out of your car and beaten a man with it. I'm not taking a pipe out. Like, remember down in La Jolla when those guys were looking for me and I threw the fucking cue ball at oh, the car? Oh, yeah. Do you remember? Like, I yeah. know how to get you rattled. Nobody could rattle you like me. I'll rattle your cage. Were you there that night where Joe Rogan, we went to the strip club? No. Oh, because Joe Rogan didn't talk to me for years after that. Because he was headlining and then we went, we went to a strip club. I thought you were there and then there was these gang members with tattoos on their faces I didn't know any, but I was young. And Joe goes, let's get out of here. And we were with other comics. I thought you were there. And I go, no, don't be a pussy. Right? Because they were like eyeing us and stuff. And then years later, I had to apologize to Joe. I go, I know we almost died. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I feel funny. I got to get out of here, man. <laughs> Why? What's I mind? feel dizzy or something, man. No, no, you're not dizzy. I'm fine? Yeah. yeah. Have, some, have some water, man. Just, just have some, yeah, I drank it and nothing happened. Have some Red Bull. <laughs> Nothing happened after the day. Have some Red Bull and some water. How's that? <laughs> what? I, 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 earlier I said that I sucked a guy's dick. Did I say that? Yes, you did. Okay. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. I feel like it's been weird ever since then. <laughs> no. No, which was, Listen, which was worse, the dick or that. asshole? What asshole? Like, uh, when you're just licking a girl's asshole. I, the dick, for sure. <sighs> I'm not gay, dude. Yeah, but I was thinking about it the other day. Have you ever sucked a dick? No. You've never? Nope. Not even once. No. You ever think about it? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 but I was I, I was thinking about it a couple like last week. For girls, it just must be like hard skin. Like that's all. Like it doesn't. What? Like it doesn't. It, it doesn't taste like anything. Like if you take exactly, a shower, that's why you should try it. <laughs> You just, you just said it was worse than eating ass. I'm not going to do it if it's worse than eating. Yeah, because ass. it's like there's like social implications, and it's like I don't want to be doing this. You know, you're drunk with your friend. Listen to me, man. When I was a kid, I was small. I was this Asian kid, but I had a sexual, a sexual drive. But I grew up in a predominantly white neighborhood. In my high school was 99.9% .9 white. And none of those girls wanted anything to do with me. You know, I always been a, always a dirty Korean. You know what I mean? My father is from, um, my father was a street guy. My father, during the Korean War, used to hustle. He never went to school. He was in gangs and stuff, and then he joined the Korean military. But my dad was a hoodlum, so I'm from, you know what I mean, Korean trash almost, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so it's like, and then we, my dad works hard, and he, we live in the suburbs, but I'm around all these, you know, white girls and stuff, they don't want nothing to do with me. So it's like, you know, you get drunk, you're 15, 16, and your friend pulls out his penis. You know, I did it. I made a mistake. No, you're very sexual. You were I'm highly sure sexual. Started. And I used to go to those, like, F Street in San Diego. We had those F Street bookstores. And they used to have those um, masturbation booths. You remember those? You sneak in, the, you go in the back, and the floor's sticky. It makes a sound. And are they people having live sex or? No, you would movie? close the door. You close the door, and then you put, you know what I mean, dollar Quarter. bills or quarters in, right? Or back, F Street had these tokens. You had to go to the front, right, you know, the give them 40 bucks, and then they give you tokens. And you put the tokens, and then you, there's a button. There's two buttons, like, you know what I mean, changing channels. And they, they were always like the puddle of comma, you know? So you have to stick your fingers in puddle of comma. Was this before the internet, or why would you go there? Yeah, this is in the late 80s, right? Jeez, so people, was that, no, but they had VCRs by then, right? Yeah, yeah, but I went to the Yeah, one. but I was a kid. He was a kid. I was so 19. Whole... I'm not going to go home oh, to my Jesus. parents' house. Yeah. What I had when I was a kid was you go in, and there was a bed in the middle. Where? <laughs> that was his number. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a bed in the middle, and there was a guy fucking like this fat chick. And then there'd Live? Be live. And then there'd be windows all around on 42nd Street. Same thing. You walked in. You locked the door. You put token in. The window would slide up. Yeah, and then there was the ones that had the plexiglass that you just watched, and people would fuck, and you could look around and see the guys jerking off like heads banging. It's fucking creepy, man. What did you ever jerk off in those? Oh fuck yeah! When I was fifteen, yeah, yeah, you have you to. Know, you yeah, don't yeah. know. You don't know. That's the first time you see like somebody actually fucking in front, and you could smell a pussy. Yeah, you could they smell let the... you in at fifteen. They didn't give a fuck. They weren't proof. That's probably in the seventies, right? That's the seventies, man. They didn't proof you. Jesus Christ! And you'd walk in and. There'd be, a, uh, there'd be a fucking janitor, 
and he'd go into every room when the door would open and somebody would walk out. Before he'd go in there, he'd go in there and drop the mop and fucking mop and put it back in with all sperm and shit. And then you go in there, put, and you had to be careful what you touched. And they'd have sex in front of you. I think I did it twice, guys. You know, just being young and stupid. But then there was times I was in the city, and I'd just go in there just to see what was going on. Just to see the the desperation. Like, I would walk by there at 9 in the morning and see 20 people, like Hasidic Jews, yeah. walking out and going, really? why are you fucking, you know, they walk out real fast, our seeds. And, you know, these are people that, it's weird when people let their religious beliefs suppress their sexual Mm. That's why all these fucking politicians, when, they, when, when somebody tells me they're a Christian, all of a sudden I see them in the bedroom fucking their wife in the ass and smacking them because they're really horny fucking devils. It's really weird. Like, I was really horny when I was a kid. And then once I realized I couldn't get pussy like the rest of my friends, <laughs> I let that emotion go in a way. And I got that's lucky exactly time what to time. That's exactly what I went through. Yeah. And I would say, you know what? Instead of going after women, I'll just masturbate. I'll just yeah. go home and masturbate, and that'll be the easy thing. I don't have to talk to them or nothing. But then, like in 87, the cocaine turned me. Like once, right before I got locked up, cocaine flipped on me, and I got really sexual with the coke. Like I could go all night <laughs> and put coke in their feet. But you got girls then, then. Yeah, yeah. I would you started getting girls. Girl. Yeah. I would always have a girl with coke, and you eat that pussy with coke. Would pops. it bum you out that they, it was only when, they, when, you, when you had coke? Because I went through a thing where... I only hooked up with girls when we were drinking, and they used to bum me out. I'm like, fuck. They have to be drunk. In those days, I didn't care. I didn't care how I got pussy because I had been suppressed for so long. Yeah. I wasn't like the rest of my friends. My friends would come to me and say, I got pussy last week down the shore. For me, I'd get a victim once a month growing up or once every six months, but I really never had a girlfriend. And I didn't have the sexual escapades my friends were having at 21 and 22. I never heard of stuff like that until I left New Jersey. I had my first threesome at 35, 36, and it was one of the worst things of my life. Yeah. I well, can't two girls and one guy? Two girls and You've never done a threesome with two guys, one girl? No. No, I couldn't I have a couple times. Looking at another guy naked. Comics, what is that comics. like? I did it with Mike Burton. You know who Mike Burton is? <laughs> no. Mike Burton's a stand-up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's still around yeah, in Chicago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike Burton and a feature, the girl. I can't say her name because right. she's still around. And we did the threesome, and... Um, he was so selfish because, you know what I mean, he would gr pull her up to his side of the bed. I didn't want to touch him. So you know what I ended up doing? Going to the side of bed and just masturbating watching them. And we also, can I just say something? We all <laughs> laughed so much. It was like the funnest sex I've ever really ever had, you know? And I did it with Aaron Cater and Brian Etheridge once in Vegas, too, at three... That was a fivesome. I was going to say, where's That was a fivesome. <laughs> you know, with, no, 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 two girls? Yeah, yeah, it was two Where girls. Where did you meet the two girls at? Dude, um, <laughs> this is so gross. So, um, you know you know Steve Shripa? Yeah. So Shripa, you know, Riviera. Yeah. So he calls me and he goes, hey, he, they, you know, because Dice used to call me Ching, right? <laughs> so so Steve Shripa used to call me Ching, right? As his Chit Ching. That's what they used to say, not racial. But I know it was racial. So he goes, hey, Ching. I go, hey, we're doing this Midnight Dirty Show. I want you to headline. I'd never headlined before. So Brian Etheridge and Aaron Cater were open micers at the time. They go, we'll drive you. You know what I mean? We'd love to see that. Right? So they drove me out there. So we're on Las Vegas Boulevard. These two sisters drive by. Right? And Brian Etheridge is driving. And the two sisters roll down the window. They go, you're cute. Not to Brian, because he's the ugliest white dude I've ever seen. Or me. They were saying it to Cater. Cater's a fucking cute Cater's boy. Good looking yeah, good-looking kid, right? Cater runs out of the car, jumps in this fucking truck. They drive out into the sunset, right? And me and Brian are fucking mad, right? So then we get to the Riviera. I go, Brian, you go do your own thing. I have to concentrate, write out my set list or whatever. So then midnight, I'm literally on stage, and I see Brian and Aaron bring in these two sisters. One well, was like a 300-pound white-lit girl, and the other one was 80 pounds, but they were sisters. And they are missing teeth. But, you know, at the time, you know, I need, you know. So anyway, after the show, Aaron goes, hey, Del, do us. So let's go to the room. So we're in the room. And so, you know, you're, no condom either. You know what I mean? Oh, God. I know. So we were doing it, you know, doing it and doing it. And then all of a sudden, like three hours later, I'm with the fat one. And Aaron's with the skinny one. I don't know where Brian is. <laughs> I don't know where Brian is. So I look around the room. I don't know where Brian is. Maybe he's in the bathroom. No, he's not in the bathroom. 
So I keep doing, I'm doing doggy style with this fat one. And I feel something tickling my butthole. It was like a feather. You know what I mean? I turn around, no one's there. So it was like paranormal. You know what I mean? <laughs> I thought it was like a paranormal There's experience. There's a ghost tickling your butthole? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, like, I keep going, and I find, and, and then I, I definitely feel something, you know, like ob- like something, you know what I mean? And I look down, Brian had crawled underneath my body, and he, he was eating her pussy while I'm having sex with her. Now, let me tell you something. <laughs> let me tell you something. You have to imagine what is on his face now at this point. You know, my little gook juice. He's got gook juice, fat juice. You know what I mean? Mixed together. You know what I mean? Who knows what kind of you know. Is on Why not just go for the blow, Joe? What is he? Doing? I don't know, but he goes. She likes it. She likes it. I don't like it <laughs> because it's like his chin is rubbing against my taint. I don't like it. It's weird, right? I can't get hard. That is so disgusting. It, was, you know, it gets worse. So I decide to power fuck her. <laughs> so, right? So I go. You know how you do it? Power. Am I, I gonna get in trouble for saying time? I haven't no. power fucked nobody in ten years. Yeah, trust all me. Right. So I go like that. You know what I mean? And you know I slipped out, right? So I try to stick it back in, and but Brian had moved up, right, and it rubbed against his eye, <laughs> right. So then we all disband, you know what I mean? Because like he screamed, you know what I mean? And I go, why? We got to fight. I go, why are you down there? You, you know what I mean? He's like, you purposely. I, I didn't purposely, you know. So then afterwards we go to breakfast. <laughs> so I'm taking these two girls out for breakfast. Aaron's there, and we're talking, laughing. I just can't wait to go to sleep. And I look at Brian from across the table. His left eye completely closed with a <laughs> yellow film. A yellow film had closed it shut, like an adhesive, right? I go, dude, we gotta go to the fucking hospital. He goes, no, I'm good. I go, no, you're not good. You can't fucking see out of that eye. It's like infected. It's red. It's like pulsing, you know? Which is his fucking fault, right? So then we go to the fucking um, hospital, right? Now we have no sleep, you know what I mean? It's a disaster, right? And we're, I'm in there with them, you know what I mean? With them, I'm like, what are we going to say, right? <laughs> he goes, I'll just make something up. So the doctor goes, what happened? And he goes, he skull fucked me. He points at me, he says, I skull fucked him. You kind of did. Not yeah, but that, you know. Did you have him check your dick? Because, like, what, what was on your dick that made his eye close up? Dude, it was not just my dick, the juice, all kinds of stuff, man. You don't <laughs> fucking listen, dude. I can't believe my sh- no, I just I went to the doctor two weeks ago. And I got all tested. My shit's clean, dog. All right? Nothing. I have no diseases. You know what I mean? No diabetes. Nothing. You're pretty serious with this girl. Man. You like I this girl. I love... I could tell that you Okay, like so it. check it out, man. How long have you been with her? Three years. Oh, two and a half years now. Two and a half yeah, half yeah. Years. Good for you. I'm you in love with you. my you girlfriend. You love her. She, we live together. We have three cats. Um, we have a podcast together called Tiger Belly. Okay. And it's doing well. And uh, I just couldn't imagine a better life right now, man. When'd you meet her? Tinder, dude. Dude, I couldn't even believe she Three swiped. years ago. Like two and a half years ago, she swiped right. We matched. Well, first of all, I had two nightmare Tinder before that, you know. Uh, one of the girls, all her photos was just of her face. And she looked like Natalie Portman. But then when I picked her up, she had Michael Chiklis' body. Like worse than yours. Like, it was just a f- complete circle. But her face was really cute. <laughs> really good face. And the other one was a comedian. I want to get into that. Wait, are you on Tinder? Were you on Tinder as Bobby Lee? Yeah, that's the best way. You know Stone Street from Modern Family? I got him on it, too. Eric After my Stone's success. Eric Stone's the big fat. Eric Stone's, no, he's not fat. He's just chubby, guy. dude. The Stone Street, I went to his house. I got him on Tinder. I've created we create a poor profile together, right? It's the best if you're a celebrity, Right? <laughs> It is because imagine, here's the thing with Tinder, all right? When you and I, we live our lives, we wake up, we have our routines, we go to our coffee shop, right? We have, you know I mean, our errands, then we do our show at the club. But you have to imagine people, even in LA or in Long Beach or whatever, Pasadena, they have their own lives. They can't make it to the comedy club, right? So it's like you're never going to run into them, right? But the Tinder. It, it just, it, you know, it, you just have more branches out there. And Kalila was always a fan of mine, right? But we just, she never just came to my shows. And so I met her for coffee. And as soon as I sat down and we, we had coffee together, I just, I remember going, fuck, in my head. Because I knew I'm in a relationship. The first time I met her. 
I already knew that this was going to be a thing. You know what I mean? You know how you can tell when you meet somebody. You just look in their eye and go, yeah, this is going to be a fucking thing. You just, there's a connection. And uh, yeah, we're, you I know. I can tell. Without, yeah, we're together and thing, yeah. we have a really good um, connection. And, you know, we've had, we've, had, we've had our problems. Everybody does. Yeah, it's hard, relationships. Does. What does she do for a living? Oh, she's a comedian. Okay, yes. Well, no, she stopped doing that, but she, um, I don't want to get into it, but she has a heart situation. Okay. She has a physical situation and she can't work right now. So instead of doing, you know what I mean, we decided to do a podcast together so that we can create maybe a business together, you know, and it's going really well. So yeah. You look good. You look healthy. Thank you. 14 fucking years of sobriety. Yeah. It seemed like, yeah, how many doors opened for you after you got sober? It took me years, dude. But how different is your life? Like my life. You look at it compared to that. Oh, my. It's not even. I've been sober from the drug that killed me for eight years. Coke. I still smoke pot. Yeah, that's fine. I don't take pills. I yeah. still smoke my pot. My friend gave me anxiety pills. If I can't sleep after a plane, I'll take one to help me go to bed. I never really drink. I, I was never really a big drinker. I smoke my pot, and that's it. But the drug that killed me, eight years. I can't tell you how many doors have opened for me. Yeah, but you know why it helped for me is because of the fact that when I got sober, what helped was show business didn't become my life, right? For many years, show business was number one, right? And my mood and my livelihood and how I felt about myself was directly related to how I was doing my career, okay? And as soon as I got sober, that no longer was the case. You know, I want to live a life, you know. And so, you know, when my friends book shit, you know, I don't go, fuck him. I go, congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. The bottom when you out. see guys succeed, it doesn't really affect me. They're like Ken Jung. You know what I mean? He was my doctor when I got sober. You know what I mean? He, he helped me get through my detox, you know. And he... Is a bigger star than me, and I'm fine with that, you know. And a lot of people come up to me and they go, they go, oh, you, you know, what I mean, you jealous of Ken's success? No. Why would you be? Why would I be? He's a talented guy, and I'm fine with it. It's those people that hate, and you know the people that naturally hate. You could see him when you first got Mad TV and you walked into the comedy store. There were some people who gave you a big hug. And there were some people who gave you a fucking Michael Corleone Fredo hug. And you felt it. You were yeah. like, Jesus Christ, why are you like this? And they, you know, and that's going back to what that jerk off said about you that night, that you're just an actor guy. That's even that day on the tweet with me, he was saying he said that I was on his jock when he got his deal. I wasn't even at the store when he got his deal. You know, I remember he got beat up in San Diego when he went to he got some Tijuana. hooker and he got beat Tijuana. up in San Diego <laughs> yeah. or something. I remember all that shit. And I always felt kind of bad for him. So when he got that attitude towards me, I was like, I just left it alone. It's like when comics fucking say, I got a deal, who gives a fuck everyone eventually gets one? You know what I mean? It's like it's, it's, people take these things and they think, think that it makes them who they are. And so what did you have to do to start making that the most important thing in your life? Well, when you, when I was... Because our drugs was killing me, and I realized that my life was more important and my family was more important. It shifts your perspective, right? Right. So, would you you were talking at the start of the podcast about you won't do certain rooms? Back then, would you have said that to those people? What do you mean? Would you have told the manager at the Kansas City, "No, I don't want to do your room anymore"? I wasn't even doing. I was so drugged out. I wasn't even headlining then. I only headlined because uh, I was still on Mad TV. I only headlined after Mad TV was canceled. And a year in, I realized that, you know, I wasn't going to be the TV star that I thought I was going to be. And that's when I started doing the road and it saved my life. Well, I got to tell you the truth. For me to get sober, I had to do something. I had to do something that I had forgotten about. I had to put myself... I, I, I thought that those 10 years I had been in Hollywood, that I was very passive with people. And I wasn't a man. Like, I didn't remember what it was like to be a man. And I remember, like, three months before getting sober, I'm like, I want to just be a man again, Bobby Lee. 
I have to get the respect of being a man again. I'm a man. Why is this happening to me? If you're a man, you shouldn't be caught up in these type of predictions and this type of bullshit. So I went back to get my character, like who I was when I was 13, when people go, hey, you want to get high? And I go, go fuck your mother. I'm not getting high. Like, I went back to look for that. Like, something interesting happened to me. I did kill Tony last Monday night. Mm -hmm. And I was telling Lee, I watched the comedians go on stage, those young comics, to do a minute, you know? Have yeah. you ever done the show? A couple times, yeah. And you see when people kill and you applaud for them. And I saw what my face used to look like when I was doing comedy five I years. Know. That look of that eye of the tiger. I remember when you killed for the first time. Yeah, and you killed for the first oh, time. Oh, I you, miss it. You can't go home. You can't sleep. Lee. You Nothing. For nothing. fucking a week, you, you can't sleep. You can eat heroin sleep. by the ton, and you will not fall asleep. So why isn't it as exciting anymore? Like, what check, it, check it out. Check it out. Okay. okay. I didn't get any pussy ever, right, until I was 23 years old. Okay? I used to go get, you know what I mean? I could I had to go, to, go to a brothel in Tijuana, okay? When I was 23 years old, I was a doorman at the comedy store, okay? This is in 1995. And one Saturday night, the manager let me um, host in front of a packed room. So I went up, and I fucking killed for the first time. You know what happened? Not only did that happen, but that night, a girl called the fucking club and says, hi, my name is Jennifer. Is Bobby Lee the comedian that was a doorman there but he went up? Is he there? Fred Burns gave me the fucking phone. And she goes, I just think really, you're really cute and are you single, this and that. No way. So, yeah, so I swear to God, three days later, I'm in her house in Oceanside, California and I'm eating her pussy. And, and I'm going, not only did I kill for the first time, but now I'm getting chicks. It literally was the birth of me. Someone called a. Not, I thought it was gonna be like an agent to book you for something. They called because they thought you were hot. Yeah, and her name was Jennifer Field. You know, <laughs> that was her name. She was this cute blonde white chick from Ocean View Side, California. I want to say Ocean View because that was my first rehab when I was sixteen. But that was also in Ocean Side. But um, yeah, and I went to her house, and I remember it just being a a spiritual experience for me. So so. I mean, you must have gotten laid other times from comedy. Since then, yeah, I've been yeah. killing it. But my point, though, is is that, you know, when you the, it was the first, first time, yeah, and the first time killing, you know what I mean? And I, it's like, you know, yeah, I can, I kill, I guess, now when I'm on the road. It's my audience, and I do well on stage. But it do, you cannot capture that feeling for the first time. You chase that. It's like addiction. You yeah, chase you chase that feeling. The reason why we're still here 20 years later is we're chasing that fucking yeah, first yeah, yeah, laugh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a fucking tremendous... The, the first kill and the first time you get on stage, you cannot describe it. You cannot describe it to anybody. You cannot describe it. It's just a beautiful fucking thing. The adrenaline... Oh, my God. That adrenaline... You know, I was telling them when you headlined four shows on Sunday morning, you saw... You're fucking sore when you get on the plane. You're like, why am I sore? Yeah. Because I've been fucking working. Yeah. I'm working. I'm moving. I'm changing positions. Your feet are sinking. Into Not the only fucking... fucking that, but fucking Friday morning, you got to wake up at five in the fucking morning to do a press tour. You know what I mean? And then like, you don't, then you don't get any sleep. Your diet's fucked up. You don't know where to eat. You know what I mean? So you eat a hamburger at McDonald's. On the way to the show, I mean, it's like it's not easy. Why well, you look at? Can I have a, a drag of a cigarette at least? You could do whatever you want. Are you sure? Yeah, you can do whatever. Because you it's want. like you know, I mean that. You know, I think I'm getting buzzed from your thing. So maybe I'll smoke a cigarette and help me. I'll smoke a little cigarette there. Yeah. Never um, kill nobody. But yeah, I mean, it's tough. But you know what, guys? Can I say this? Anyone listening right now? I think the moral of the story is this, is, is that Joey and I, a lot of people don't like me, you know what I mean, I have my haters, you know what I mean, but I have a lot of fans also, and the reason why I have the, I have my girlfriend's beautiful, and the reason why I have all these things is not because I'm unique or special, it's because of the fact that a long time ago, I did a scary thing, which is choose to do stand-up, all right? The first time you go up, it's very scary, like your heart's, you know what I mean, beating, you're shaking, you know what I mean? You convince yourself, don't do it, you know? I had a friend, Randy, who made me do it the first night. 
you have to do it. I'll never talk to you again. I went up there, and it's like literally jumping out of a plane, you know, like you, you, your adrenaline, you know what I mean? And I just remember making funny noises on stage because I didn't really have any jokes. So I went up and I went, right? And I did that for three minutes because I knew that would make Randy laugh, right? And then afterwards, people were like, that was fucking weird, right? And then like <laughs> a month later, I did open mics at the comedy store, right? And Paulie saw me go up and I did the same thing, the noising, noises, right? And then I was just, you know, no joke, but just acting really weird on stage. And Polly goes, dude, you're fucking weird, brah. I go, oh, thanks. He goes, I want you to open for me in Vegas. And then, dude, I'm not kidding you. Two months after that, this is like three or four months into do comedy, I open for him in front of 5,000 people at the top of the riv. You know what I mean? But my point is, is this, is that I fucking did it. I walked through that fear, you know what I mean? And I religiously made myself do something that was that scary. And I just really believe that if you want to have a big life, you have to take big risks. You have to say, fuck it, and just to go for it. You know what I mean? And I know you, do, we, you and I don't appreciate, you know what I mean, that part of ourselves because it's just innate in us and we, we already did it. You know what I mean? But it is a fucking crazy thing that we chose to even do this in the fucking first place. You know I mean? And look at what it's got us. I mean, you talk about, you know what I mean, you, you being on set with Tracy Morgan and you know, Adam Sandler for that movie, you know what I mean? You know, a couple years ago, I was on The Dictator. I did scenes with Sir Ben Kingsley and Ed Norton, you know what I mean? And I'm like sitting on a couch talking about You can't about, believe it when it's happening. Oh, when it's happening, you're like, I, I I'm an open, it. I was an open, open micer. Open micer. Why is this guy yeah, talking? Yeah, this is great. Like Ben Kingsley, like, hey, um, so um, when you tell me the lo- that line, you know, just slow it down a bit so that I, you know, and really connect. And in my head, I'm like, I can't fucking believe I, I don't even know what the fuck I'm doing here. Like, what the fuck am I doing here? I don't even, I never take a class. I don't know nothing. <laughs> it's really fucking it's crazy. Fucking crazy it really right? It's crazy. And, and, and yet, you know, you, you're in these situations because, not because you, I'm talented or. But I'm, you are I'm, talented. I'm not. Like, isn't, don't you have. No, 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 it's not. It's not talent. That's what, listen. That's it's not the talent. the best thing Conor McGregor has ever said in his life. This is not talent. This is an obsession. That's what it this is. This is an but, obsession. But don't you think that your obsession creates talent? No. Stand up, dude. I never thought I had talent. I don't no. know what the fuck people are talking about. It's, what it is is this. It's repetition. All right? When you do something enough, eventually what happens is the fear and the, and the fear of failing goes away because you failed so many times that you inevitably grow a thick skin. You do. So then eventually bombing doesn't destroy you as much. And then eventually you're kind of immune to it. I mean, it hurts a little bit. You hate it. But it's, it doesn't aff- – like when you go home, you're watching CNN and you, you forget about it, right? But it's like you eventually – it's just repetition and walking through fear. And, as, and if you fail enough, you become immune to it. And then when you become immune to it, you're yourself. Yeah, but there's – there's a lot of people who have been doing open mics for 10, 20 years, whatever. I'm not going to say that you're all, like the Mount Rushmore of comedy, but you have there has to be some talent involved in it. You, here's the thing is, is that I, I will agree this. I will agree with this. I can I – know, I know how comedy is supposed to work. Like when, you, when, I, when I was a kid, I used to watch George Carlin. You would watch him and go – Okay, I see. You know what I mean? You 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 laugh, and then you kind of think, "Why did I laugh at that?" Uh, because you know you thought he was saying this, and then he said that. You know what I mean? So it was a switch or whatever. So you you learn. You know, as a kid, you analyze like why a joke works. But it's like, I'm fucking. You know, I I'm not a talented. I really think, and I've thought this for a while. That and actually, Denzel had a line about this in uh, Gangs of King of Gangs of New York, whatever it was. Um, where he said like the loudest person in the room is the weakest one in the room. I think that if you think you're good at something, you're probably not great at it. And if you think you're terrible, like what you think you're terrible at, it's because you have so much pride or so much, so much love for it that it's never going to be good enough, even when it is. I laugh. Well, every movie when I get on every movie and I do a take, I giggle inside. Yeah. Like when they're like, "All right, you ready for your scene?" And I walk out on set. And people come up to me like, Mr. Diaz, 
are you okay? I'm like this poor bastard. You know, like yeah. these people. I don't even know how I got here. I don't like how did I get hired for this shit? If these people knew that twenty years ago I was crawling <laughs> through a fucking window to steal somebody's blow. <laughs> If they only fucking knew. Like, yeah. I can't believe I'm on this fucking set with these nice white people and, and people with a lint brush taking lint off my shirt and trying to make me look nice. And you're like, why? Yeah, yeah when I was why? on animal practice, right, I would show up an hour early. Like, how come you're here an hour early? Because I can't fucking believe you even want me in this. Yeah, I can't believe you want well, me. I don't want to get fired. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can't believe well, it. I can't believe it. I'm, I'm doing scenes with a monkey. It was like a monkey one time. I had to do a dialogue scene with the monkey. And the camera's on me, but it has the back of the monkey's head. And I'm killing it. Like, I'm like, and then they're like, we have to do it again because the monkey's head moved. And I'm like, and they're like, we're so sorry. I go, fuck it. You know what I mean? I'm doing a scene with a monkey. Like, this is not supposed to ever happen. They have no idea. I'm supposed to be dead. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. like when I see people who take shit seriously in this business. Yeah. It drives me crazy. What do you mean by taking when it seriously? When I go on a set and like, like I was on a set with this really so-called famous director on a TV show. TV show sucked. <laughs> and the director was old and he was out of fucking touch. But still in Hollywood, he counted for something. And I get that he was blasting music. Like, it was the loudest music I ever heard on set. In my world, a star does that. You know what I'm saying? Like, Brad Pitt could do that. Like, you know... The director, I go, what's going on? They're like, the well, director is good friends with Bruce Springsteen. So he likes to listen to him loud. <laughs> Fuck that punk ass bitch. Yeah. Like that set was misery for me because there was ego, so much ego all the way on the way up. You know yeah. what I'm saying? There was so much ego that I did a commercial once with it. You know, you could always, if I could tell who the director is by his outfit. Yeah. <laughs> who is, what, so you did a commercial. Who was the director? I don't know what his name was. Uh, but he was uncomfortable? Very uncomfortable. And I got into an argument with him, and he never messed with me again throughout the whole production. It, was, it wasn't Joe Pitka, was it? No, that's my boy. You love Joe Pitka? Isn't he the guy that, that books a lot of commercials or something? No, he's a director. He's, a he's director. like, he did like the Bow Nose campaign. He did, he's supposed to be like the Spielberg of. Joe Pitka directed me in the Taco Bell commercial I did with the dog. Oh, you did? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he had a company. Yeah, he put me in three commercials. That dude. Yeah, you made a lot of money, right? Yeah, yeah. I did twenty commercials. You know what he used to say to me? He used to call me Pan Face Gook. Joe Pick. I yeah. forgot that fucking. He name. fucking told a fucking girl that was he had hired. You have whore hair. You look like a whore. He was crazy. He was fucking crazy, and he was the only man that I ever worked for where literally I was scared shitless. 24 7. Like, I remember, like, you, I, I did a commercial for him and I go, I'll never work for him again. And then, like, eight years later, I get a call. Joe wants, because this is when I was on Mad TV, he goes, he wants to do another IBM commercial. I go, you know what? I could handle it. Because, you know, I've already done it. You know what I mean? I could get, as soon as I said, on this, I literally pee was coming out of my penis. Big he, guy, right? Yeah, he's tall. He has tall. white hair. Yeah, big guy. Yeah, big he guy. retired. He was a legend. Like, he was... Legend. The best commercial director of all time. Okay, right? let me tell you his solid with your Uncle Joey. Yeah. He hired me for the first Taco Bell commercial with the dog. Yeah. It was a Miami commercial. I got the call back. It was shooting on the 3rd of July, 4th of July, 5th of July. I get down the 3rd of July, and they go, hey, man, they cut the commercial. But Joe wants you to hang out here for the three days, and they're still going to pay you. Oh, said, my okay. God. I said, okay. Well, day one, I eat. I don't say nothing. I'm very happy just to be on the set. It's day two, during lunch, you know, we're doing our thing. Yeah. I'm doing Joey. You know, some guys are fucking with me. I'm fucking with them. He heard my voice, and he came over to me after lunch, and he goes, stick around today. I'm going to put you in this fucking commercial. Because they were like, if you want to leave at 5, that's your 8 hours. But if you want to stay till midnight, you can stay till midnight. We'll pay you the overtime. Just don't stay out of our way. That's what, This is 97, when commercials were still commercials, where you could get rich off a fucking commercial. And the next day, he came up to me and he goes, I'm going to put you in a scene. I don't give a fuck. And he put me in the scene. I did it. And six weeks later, I get a call from the actor. The, there was three stand-ups that, on that set. I was a principal, the other guy was a principal, and the other guy was an extra. 
the guy that was the top principal called me and he goes, did you get your letter from Taco Bell? And I go, no. And he goes, yeah, I got my letter. They didn't pick me up. They're probably not going to pick you up either. And they picked you up? They picked me up. And the extra got picked up because the extra had contact with me. So when an extra has contract with a principal, he automatically becomes a principal. So every time I saw that comic, he did everything but suck my dick. <laughs> because I told him, just stick next to me. We're going to get in this commercial together. So he jumped. I go, get the thing and shine my shoes. Yeah. And he was shining my shoes during the commercial. So he became a principal. So every time I see that guy till today, he stops what he's doing. And he comes over and gives me a big hug. And that was Joe Pitka. He put me in the I want to say something. that yeah. I want to apologize for what I said earlier about Joe Pitka. No, seriously. He did call me those things, right? But I want to just say this. I... He gave me a commercial once where I made $350,000. No, you didn't. I swear to God, I did. No, you didn't. Yeah. It was a campaign for IBM. Wow. And I, um, I want to apologize to Joe. Thank you so much for that. You know what I mean? I was uncomfortable during your sets because, I mean, on your, on your set because I felt intimidated. But I just want to thank you for putting me in your commercials. And I really apologize. He for, put me in three fucking I'm, commercials. Yeah, I want to apologize. You're the best. And that's it. You know what? Your fucking marijuana smoke got into my mind. Let me call to do these things. Okay. Let me give some shout outs. Brian Nelson, Paranormal, Diane Mateo, Julio Villalobos, Villalobos, Chris McDugan, Andrew Nelson, Lavar Michaels, and Joey Zaza tweets. Look at you, sexy motherfucker. Bobby Lee's gonna be at the improv in Houston, Texas. February 12th to the 14th. That's Valentine's Day, bitches. I'm going to be at the Charlotte Comedy Zone this weekend. And next week, I'm at St. Louis Helium. I'm sorry if I got you high tonight. I didn't mean to. No, that's that. fine. You, you I'm totally fine. Smoke. It's I'm totally right. fine. What's up with you, Lisa? I got sucker. You happy for the new office? I'm do yeah, I'm doing great. I have uh, tomorrow a new episode of Life in Neutral with Johnny Rock. All right. And uh, yeah, I'm just doing great. I'm really happy about this. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's so like when people. Hearing you talk about all the th nice things that people did for you, this is the ni this this is the nicest thing that anyone's done for me. This is the so, oh man, what? No, I mean, I mean, <laughs> no, but it, it's this is and what you guys. I mean, it's it's a different thing, but for me, Are you gonna cry right now? No, oh, well, who knows? But like coming out and doing this pod, like podcasting, it's in November. It was two years that I've only done podcasting, and. It's it's I'm now where like I, I, where you guys were I don't know how many years in, but it's it's nice to see those nice things and and Joe when when Joey takes me out to dinner, it's it's we went to Jerry's Deli a few weeks ago a week ago, and I had a ro I had a roast beef sandwich and it was just it, it's uh it's nice and it's nice to see that you guys remember it these many years later like when you. When you guys see Dorman, that when you were a doorman, like do you go over and give him a hug? Hugs. Or, yeah. I don't, I don't hug them, but I talk to them. You I know? talk to the young guys. Yeah, today. yeah, I talk to them. Yeah. I do their shows. I, I try to get involved. Them, Listen, man, I can't tell you how good Andrew Dice Clay was to me and to Bobby Lee. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how nice Paul Mooney was to me. You know how many jo you know how many steaks Joe Rogan has bought me? Do you have any idea how many fifty dollar steaks that kid has bought me? More than my mother. I've been friends with Joe for 20 years. My mother was only around for 16. And my mother ate a lot of steaks. <laughs> Do you understand me? Yeah. So how can I not buy everybody else's steak? You know how many fucking lobster tails? You know how many times I went to eat with Joe and I had no money in my pocket? And he'd say, hey, man, we're going to get the seafood tower. And I'd sit there and go, seafood tower? I'll eat the ice. <laughs> you know how it is with yeah. Carlos. You just take you out. Yeah. So you have to do that. You have to do that. I have to show the young guys, the old, and I've said this on this show a thousand times, the better I treat the young guys, the better my career and the better comedian I will become. That's the fucking thing right there, dude. You know, there's a book called The Seven Spiritual Laws of Success. It's by Deepak Chopra. One of the laws of success is you have to go out of your way and help other people achieve success. That's one of the laws. Why does he say that works? Well, there's a bunch of stuff that's in there. You have to meditate and all that stuff. But it's just, it's a karmic, it's, it's karma, I believe. It's, it's, you know, if you help people achieve success, it's selfless, 
right? It's not about you. And I think just energy wise, it just comes back at you, dude. You, you know? know? You generate your own energy. When you go to yoga, you open your chakras and you generate your own energies. You have kinetic energy and it becomes potential energy, not by you sitting there like a putz, but by doing. You know, this podcast is about, I bring a thousand people on this podcast that we've all had the same struggle. We've all started at a place when we sucked. Nobody liked us, and then we saw the evolution of men. We saw how, how there were people who didn't like you 10 years ago, they'll suck your dick now. <laughs> you follow me, especially yeah, yeah. when you're on Mad TV, right or wrong. Yeah. There's people that stop talking to you after Mad TV. Yeah. You learn about human, but all you can do is never get bitter, and keep looking at those younger guys, give them hugs, tell them they did great because this is what happens. When I see you and I go, you're hungry, whatever, a steak, whatever the fuck you want, it just makes me a better comic and a better man. And that, at the end of the week, every day you want to be a better fucking man. I struggled in a drug addiction for years where at the end of the night I would cry myself to sleep because this isn't the life I chose. It was a life I had been caught up in. But every day you struggle. And when you see somebody and you help somebody out, and it doesn't have to be financially, Bobby Lee. It could just be going up to somebody and going, bro, that was a great set. Yeah. That was a great joke. Yep, 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 yep. Not me sitting in the back and going, ha! Ah! When Bobby Lee does a funny joke. I don't do nothing for nobody. That just makes you a fucking jack off like everybody else. <laughs> it's when I come up to you after a show. I don't know what's going on in your mind. You know what? You might have just killed, but your mother's in the house, bro. And me coming up to you going, dog, that's a good fucking joke. When you get in your car, that might just bring a tear to you eye. That just might, that's the shit that makes comics. That's the way I was taught to be a comedian. But it wasn't the way I was taught to be a comedian. It's how you're taught to be a fucking man. Becky, how hot is Becky? How hot is Becky? She's yeah. beautiful, yeah. She's fucking beautiful. Yeah. Everybody in this room wants to, did you see how far good she looked in those pants? Uh, what, what am I going to do by hitting on Becky? You can't hit on everybody. No. You can't. These little things you have to do as a man. And that's it. You can't. I'd love to fucking eat Becky's asshole and sniff it and let her do jujitsu for an hour and sit <laughs> on my face. That's what it's all about. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you can't bang everybody. That's part of being a man. You know, there's little things that we forget. We forget. Caparulo forgot. You know, people forget. But you know fine. what? But he was young. And I believe, I believe he will change, and I will. I believe that he'll get better. Yeah, he will. He yeah. will, because he just lost it, and it happens. Like I said, I lost it with the longest yard, but it went in the other direction. It didn't propel my ego; it propelled my sadness, because I let myself believe that a movie was going to change my life. Yeah. <laughs> You really let yourself. We for a long time we said, when I get mad TV, that I'll show them. It's not that you got sober and you realized what you had and you helped the younger guys when you took that rider and then go, come here, I'm going to put you in this sketch. Yeah. That thing. And I could see you. I remember when I got a call one day going, you and the other kid would put me in a sketch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I saw how you were. I saw what you had become on that show. You were no longer the kid in the corner. Now you had hands on. You were doing oh, shit. Yeah, 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 you yeah. know, and I was proud of you. I'm like, look at Bobby Lee calling me in for a day's pay, hugging me in front of everybody, you know. Bobby didn't just go get the fuck out. He hugged me to make everybody know this is my brother. He eats the best off that craft service, motherfucker. He gets the sandwiches made. And that's what this whole thing is about. It's not hating Bobby when he's on stage or hating this guy because he got a TV show. Mm -hmm. You have to be happy because when I'm happy, I know that I'm that much closer. If I'm happy for Bobby, oh, shit. Bobby got a TV show? That means my number's got to be fucking next. Because I was on that same production line. We were on that same production line. That same... We were on the Mitzi Shore production line. Yeah. And in my world, that means something. When I didn't have an agent, when I didn't have a fucking... I didn't go to Montreal, when I didn't get a half-hour special, I didn't got nothing. I had something over anybody in this town. Mitzi Shore touched me. Nobody else made me a regular. I didn't send a tape to nobody. I auditioned for that bitch twice, and she touched me. So I always knew I had something fucking going on. You didn't eat her pussy like others did, though, did no, you? No, I did. No, I did. We know was... a couple of comics that we're friends with that ate her pussy, and it's fucking disgusting. <laughs> 
Let's give me the the thing. Like, yeah. All right. Don't forget. I gotta go, dude. Because I, I love got, you to death. I love you too. I love if you. I just leave, that cool? That's cool. I'll read that. All right. All right. Look, man. I'm happy you drove up here. I know I you have you, a podcast man. at 11. Just don't steal my white lighter. That's the I'm only thing. Where's your white light? This is yours? That's mine. Because if not, I go to smoke weed. I got no light. Give me a hug, cocksucker. <laughs> I love you, man. I love you. Don't that was great. Thank man. you for the story, man. Good to see man. you again, brother. Nice to see you, Bobby. All right. Don't forget, as usual, we got great sponsors. This one is no different. This is their first night with us, and I got to tell you something. I'm very impressed. I gave it to Lisa. I gave it to Damon, and Damon installed it, and he fucking loved it. All right? So let me... Uh, let me just read this to you, and you guys tell me what the... There's a sound of a package being delivered, a friend's coming over for dinner, but it's also the sound of somebody planning to rob you blind. Over 90, 95% of home break-ins happen during the day, and burglars almost always start by ringing your doorbell to see if somebody's home before they pillage your possessions, okay? With the Ring Video Doorbell, you can see and talk to anyone at your front door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. So if somebody rings your doorbell, and let's say you're, you're at yoga, and you see this guy, you could get on there and tell him you'll be home in an hour or 10 minutes or whatnot from anywhere, okay? Rings advanced motion detection alerts you. Even if someone doesn't ring the doorbell, it's like the caller ID for your home. With the Ring Video Doorbell, you can talk to delivery people and keep an eye on your package. If someone tries to mess with it, you'll get an instant alert and HD video, the whole thing. It's like having a neighborhood keep an eye on your home 24-7 without the judgment, okay? Let me tell you something. I used to be a burglar, and this is the way to catch a burglar, anybody in your neighborhood, because it's got motion detectors, so it'll turn the lights on. You connect this to your doorbell. It works in a thousand different ways. Installing the Ring video takes minutes, and it works either with your current wiring or a built-in rechargeable battery. Put your mind at ease and protect your home with the video doorbell, Time Magazine, and USA Today named one of their top 10 gadgets. My listeners, ready for this one? People who listen to the podcast will get a free expedited FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash church. Again, that's ring.com slash church. That's all you need to do. We're going to get you FedEx shipping free. With the Ring Video Doorbell, you're always home. Do me a favor. Start by going to ring.com church now. But go to ring.com. I want you to do that favor. See how this product works. You know, I'm not really good with gadgets. I don't know if Lee took a look at it. But just from what I was talking to Damon, this bell is tremendous. It's, it, go, it goes right to your phone. It looks it looks like you're having like a FaceTime video call. Yeah. And it, it goes right to your phone. And you can even pretend like you are home. Oh, I'm just stuck in the, sh- I'm stuck in the shower. And you come back in 15 yeah. minutes. It's, it's tremendous, guys. But do, do me a favor. Go to ring.com right now. That's how it starts. Go to ring.com. Read everything about it. If you like what you see, press in church and bam. You get free FedEx shipping when you go to ring.com slash church. That's ring.com slash church. And as usual, I'd like to thank my main sponsors over there at onit.com. Always, always with the best product. If it's not the hemp force protein, it's the tea at. I mean, they just have stuff. Every time I go to their webpage, I'm in shock. But I always think, you know me, I'm an old-fashioned guy. The Shroom Tech Sport, the Shroom Tech Immune, and the Hemp Four Protein, I live and die by those. I live and die with I had a Hemp Four today after I took Mercy to the park. I love that. With my banana, my water, a little, a little bit of sugar. Tremendous, guys. Anyway, don't listen to me. Go to onit.com right now. If you see something you like, go to the box and press in. Church. And get 10% off your first order. And this, again, like Ring and all my products. Get delivered to your door, okay? This gets delivered to your door. If you want to get on the Stay On It program where they deliver different packages to your door every month, just let them know. They have the Stay On It program. You get an additional 10%. I'd like to thank our new sponsor, Ring.com. Go to Ring and see all the advantages that doorbell gives you. I'd like to thank Onit.com. I'd like to thank Bobby Lee and my main man, Lee Sayet. You happy, cocksucker? I'm thrilled. Thank you, buddy. It was a... This is fun. It's it's gonna be a lot of fun in the studio. It's be a tremendous one. We'll be back Wednesday afternoon. It's just me and Lee and a call-in show. I love you guys. Thank you very much. And as usual, should we play some music, a little turntable music for you, Absolutely. motherfuckers? Let me do the ad real quick. And we'll just to show you guys what we got here tonight. I'm gonna play a little bit of fucking. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna play what I was playing on the Periscope. How about a little bit of uh, in through the outdoor. In the evening. How's that, motherfuckers? Sounds good. This show is brought to you by Ring. 
Go to ring.com slash church right now to get free expedited FedEx shipping. It's ring.com slash church for the brand new best video doorbell on the market. Show is also brought to you by onnit.com. Use code word church to get 10% off all of the great optimization products. Thank you again for listening. See you Wednesday. Have a great Tuesday. Good night, cocksucker. In through the outdoor. Like I said before, 1979. A tremendous fucking album. 